Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... I'm E.G. Marshall, presiding as usual over a vintage assortment of tales of mystery, terror, excitement, and suspense. Someday we shall simply have to rid ourselves of all the well-worn cliches that obscure our speech and corrode our thinking. And for our present purposes, we should start with the one that says, ignorance is bliss. The fact of the matter is that the truly ignorant are seldom blissful. Indeed, they are usually unhappy, suspicious, stubborn, and frustrated. True, a little bit of wisdom may be dangerous, but a great deal of ignorance is usually fatal, as we shall demonstrate. The garden. I've, I've never seen such flowers. Beautiful, aren't they? Yes, how do you grow them? Oh, that's my secret, darling. Oh, should there be a secret between husband and wife? Well... The whole neighborhood's talking. How do you grow such flowers? You wouldn't want to know. Tell me. No. I insist. Very well. It's how you water them. Oh? Well, how do you water them? With blood. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Flowers of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mercedes McCambridge. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. those who strive to be different, who march to the rhythms of their very own drummers, and these are a breed apart. When they succeed, we hail them as geniuses. When they fail, we confine them as madmen. In either case, they remain a mystery to most of us. They are beyond the common understanding. This is because, for so many of us, the usual tendency is to play it safe. The usual advice is, don't stick your neck out. The usual goal is to be like everybody else. Don't rock the boat. 
don't make waves. These have been articles of faith for Walter Morrison and for Gretchen, his wife. Hello? Charlie. Walter, where are you? At the office. I called to tell you I'll be late for dinner tonight. Oh, Walter. Well, it can't be helped here. Parker's in from the coast, and I can score some points if I hang around and just chat with him, okay? All right. Oh, uh, uh, we should ask Parker and his wife out to dinner. Oh, she's really a horrible woman, Walter. Well, sure she is, but Parker can do me a lot of good. <laughs> All right, dear. I'll see if I can set him up. If, if it's, uh, go, wear brown. Brown? Yes, it's your least flattering color. You shouldn't look too good. She's older than you, and she'd resent it. <laughs> yes, dear, I understand. Is there anything else you want me to do, Walter? No, that's about it. See you later. Oh, just a minute. Hello. Yes, what is it? Mm, I was right. You were right about what? About you. Oh, uh, look, I don't buy anything from door-to-door -door salesmen. In that event, may I trouble you for a glass of water? Water? Actually, I'd prefer a glass of wine if you had it. I suppose it's uh, an odd request. In this century, in this place, in this time, the concept of hospitality has ceased to exist. Uh, sir, I'm really very busy. Now, consider your ancestors... They would have invited me inside with a hearty welcome, prevailed upon me to stay for supper, spend the night. I'm really not interested. Today, the stranger who rings the doorbell is directed to the nearest motel, if indeed the door is opened at all. Oh, you'll have to excuse me. My uh, telephone is ringing. No, it isn't. I warn you, I'll scream for help. I'll, I'll call for the police. You simply don't know how to handle this at all, do you? What do you want? What are you selling? What do you need? I already told you I don't want to buy anything. That's not what I asked you. I asked you what you needed. I don't need anything. Now, please, just let me close the door. Is that really true, that you don't need anything? Yes. You have everything your heart desires. Yes, now, please. Love, happiness, fulfillment. Uh, yes, yes. Think carefully. Don't answer quickly. I told you. I don't want anything you're selling. I'm not selling anything. Well, then why did you ring my... As I was walking by, I saw you at your window. You reminded me of someone. Someone I knew a long time ago. I'm... I'm really not interested. You should be. I mean you no harm. Then what... I saw your face. It reminded me of someone I loved once. But I can't remember her name. Oh, please, I'm frightened. Don't be afraid. You remind me of her. But who was she? There were so many. I must tell you, I love deeply and with all my heart, but not for long. Never for long. Who are you? God. You are what? I should say, a God. That's... That's... That's what? Impossible. Why? Because. Because everyone knows. What everyone knows is usually nonsense. It's what you know. What I know that counts. You say you're a god. Remember, I can see your mind. You've decided to humor me. You believe that I'm a lunatic. You hope I'm harmless. Oh, why do you say you can read my mind? Isn't it natural for me to think that a person who... My name is Dionysus. Dionysus? The ancient Greek god of wine and growing things. Well, I don't care much for wine, but I wish you could help me with my garden. You are beautiful when you smile. <laughs> Suddenly this whole thing just makes me laugh. Why do you say you're Dionysus? Because it's true. I'm, I'm dreaming. I must be dreaming. What are dreams? Dionysus. I remember I had a course at school, at college, in ancient lit. It was a long time ago. Dionysus and Apollo, yes, and Zeus and Pallas Athena. My sisters, my brothers. Dionysus, the god of growing things. I think 
I fell in love with you then. I know. Why have you come to me now? Because nothing grows in your heart anymore. What is this life you lead? This dull, empty life? Oh, I'm... I'm very happy. Walter and I, we're happy. We... Gretchen, why does nothing grow in your garden? Oh, things grow. They do. Then why did you say you wish I could help you with your garden? Well, because... I know, because nothing grows with beauty, with fire. Once, in another life, you were in my garden. The Garden of Dionysus. I remember now. Yes. And I'm sorry for the way it ended. You remember how it ended? Yes. It always ends badly when one of the immortal gods loves a woman of the earth. The garden. Do you remember the garden? I remember. You will live in that garden again. With you. That garden shall be in your own heart. And everything beautiful will grow from it. I have walked the world and wandered the centuries in search of you. And now I've found you again. I love you. I love you. But will you leave me again? Never. I will always be in your garden. My thought will always be in your heart. Come. Come, love. Let us walk in the garden. Ah, Walter. Have a chair, my boy. Well, thank you, sir. Read the report, Walter? First-rate job. Well, I appreciate that, sir. Well, now, Walter, Carraway's resigned. Yes, so I've been told, Mr. Baylor. And you don't have to be told the assistant general sales manager's job's wide open. Well, I don't have to be told that at all, sir. It's the jump, Walter. The big one. Yes, I've been aiming for it these past ten years. Well, we just don't promote a man around here. We promote a team. A team? A man and his wife. Oh, oh, I understand that. <laughs> Glad you do. Man has to have the right kind of wife. Yes, well, Gretchen is absolutely perfect, sir. Good. I'd like to meet her. Uh, well, sir, may I invite you to our house for dinner? Well, thank you, Walter. I accept. And uh, what did you say her name was? Gretchen. Hmm. Sounds like a, a frivolous name. Well, her, her real name is Margaret, sir, but you see, Gretchen is a, is a kind of nickname. I prefer Margaret. Well, Mr. Baylor, I'm sure we can call You see, her... my boy, it's just after that very unfortunate experience with Carraway's wife. Here we have a man who's assistant general manager of this company, and his wife is practically a hippie. Gets your name in the news with all kinds of unsavory and disreputable people. Yes, I understand, sir. You might say I'm, I'm snake-bitten. We, uh, the company, we simply cannot afford yes, to take... Yes, naturally, Mr. Baylor. I can assure you that Gret... That my wife is everything the wife of an executive of this corporation should be. I'm sure of it, my boy. When, uh... When would it be convenient for you to dine with us, Mr. Baylor? Are you free Friday night? Yes, of course. Good, good. Friday night for dinner. Thank you, sir. And, and Walter, I, I think I can offer you my congratulations. Oh, my love, my love. Don't leave me. Stay. Stay. Margaret. Margaret, are you all right? My love, you're not going. I'm oh, not yet. Margaret. Not yet. Margaret. What? Honey. Oh, I was dreaming. I was dreaming. Well, this is, uh, unlike you to just nap on a couch in the living room. Are you all right? Yes. Yes. It was only a dream. Oh, but I don't have dinner ready. I must have fallen asleep. Well, that's all right. I'll take you out. We'll celebrate. Celebrate? What? It's happened. Assistant General Sales Manager. Oh, Walter. Remember, remember, that's what we aimed at ten years ago. Well, today, today we hit the target. Is it official? Just about. Only one tiny detail. And that is... You. Me? What, what I... have you got to do with it? Everything. Oh, I don't understand. Now, listen, Margaret. Why do you think Carraway resigned? What did you call me? Margaret. 
Oh, my name is Gretchen. Well, yes, perhaps, but Gretchen comes from Margaret. Oh, I don't like Margaret. That's why I call myself Gretchen. Well, Margaret suits you better, dear. It's more mature, more dignified. I don't think so. Well, Mr. Baylor does. Well, why should my name be any of Mr. Baylor's business? Darling, before we get sidetracked, I asked if you knew why Caraway resigned. What does Mr. Baylor have against my name? Caraway didn't jump, darling. He was pushed. His wife didn't fit in. What does that mean? Evidently, a man's wife has to fit a certain image in this corporation. Well, I was never involved in any of your business things before. Yes, I know, but now it'll be different. Why did you say Mrs. Carraway didn't fit in? Well, she wasn't too careful about what she said. Why? What did she say? Well, you met her. She, she's the type who says a lot of kooky, oddball things. All I know is that she said to me she couldn't take this... This rat race, serious. Well, a corporation is supposed to be your life. You just can't say things like that in front of people like Mr. Bailey. Well, do I have to meet Mr. Bailey? Darling, what's gotten into you? Walter is the company your life. Well, of course it is. It's always been. It's my career. It's our living. Now, that should answer that question. Are you going to meet Mr. Bailey here Friday night? He's coming to dinner. Did you have to invite him? He wanted to look you over here in your own setting. Why? Well, to determine whether you'd be an asset to the company. I see. Darling, what, what has gotten into you? Why all these questions? I'm sorry. I... I had this dream. About what? I can't seem to remember. All right, forget it. Come on, let's go out to dinner right now. Okay. And, Walter, mm -hmm. you're Mr. Baylor, I promise you. He'll be proud of me. Darling, I know that. Now, where would you like to eat? Oh, anywhere. Now, just remember, we can now afford the very best. Walter, uh, look. Look. What, what, what? What is that? The garden. What about the garden? Look at the flowers. Well, where? Where did you get those flowers? They, were, they weren't... Here this morning. Look at those colors. Did you ever see such colors? Yes, red. Such brilliant red. Roses and carnations and... Oh, I've, I've never seen such beautiful the flowers. The garden. Our garden. His and mine. What did you say? It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a dream. Well, where are we? We have a quiet, rather shy, and self-effacing middle-class suburban housewife, just this side of 40. A stranger rings her bell, announces he is an ancient Greek god, Dionysus, and that he wants to be her lover once again. Notice that again. Well, it has to be a dream, you say. Sure. But how about the sudden blooming of that lush, brilliant, beautiful garden? How about it? Further growth must await my return in just a few minutes with Act Two. Is this how it was in the ancient days? Did the gods appear in dreams? All the loves we read about, between the immortals and their human subjects, were these all dreams? Visions? Well, we don't know. We present only the facts in the case. And the basic fact in this case seems to be that suddenly the garden of Gretchen Morrison is a lush, luxuriant riot of color after she had dreamed that she had a love affair with the ancient god Dionysus. Well, people have had even more extravagant dreams from what I've heard. It wasn't a dream. It wasn't a dream. What are you saying? I... Oh, nothing. Charlie, how did you ever get all those flowers to... Well, I, I, I'd say it's miraculous. Hi there, Gretchen. Whoa. Oh, hello. Hello, Porter. Uh, how's the golf? Hey, what have you folks done here? Well, you know, Margaret, she just putters around in the garden. Ma Margaret? Who, who's Margaret? Oh, oh, that's my nickname for Gretchen. What have you done to your garden, Gretchen? Uh, 
Uh, nothing. Oh, come on, Gretchen. I'm, I'm willing to abdicate gracefully. June and I consider ourselves the garden people in this neighborhood. Well, Porter, I, uh... And quite frankly, Gretchen, we never saw you as a threat. What I mean is, you did have a few respectable-looking plants. Yes, isn't it fantastic, Porter? Is it a fertilizer, a new kind of food? Now, dear, don't give away your secrets. Oh, come on, Gretchen, we've always been good friends. Well, they just grew, that's all. Oh, very shrewd, and I don't blame you. Every one of them is a sure winner at the Garden Club show next month. Well, just think, Porter, this will be the first year you're not going to win. I'll get to the bottom of this somehow. Yeah, well, good night, Porter. Good night. Margaret, Margaret, how how did you raise those flowers? How? Huh? Oh, I suppose you could call these the fruits of love. <laughs> Margaret, M Margaret, oh, oh, there you are. Didn't you hear me call you? You were calling Margaret. Now, look, dear, it's only for Mr. Baylor's sake. My name is Gretchen. Well, all right, we'll just go along with it for tomorrow night. Now, what are you doing out here? I'm sitting among my flowers. Well, should, shouldn't we uh, be inside with dinner? I was just listening. Listening to what? To what they were saying. To what? Who's saying? My flowers. Your fl Flowers? They, they can't say anything. Oh, that isn't true, Walter. They're speaking now. Well, I, I don't hear anything. You don't hear flowers. You see them. Each color has a meaning. Now, Gretchen... That rose bush just in front of you. It isn't the same shade of red all the time. From instant to instant, it darkens and then lightens as the flowers feel and think. Margaret, quit this nonsense. Walter, it isn't nonsense. Yes, it is. Now, dear, I know. I know you're under a strain. But I'm not. Yes, you are. And I was thinking about it. Now, tomorrow night is the most important night in our lives. It is? Why? Why? Oh, my God. Which one? Please listen. Now, you and I, we've worked for this. We have ten years invested in tomorrow night. Oh, please, Walter, you mustn't excite yourself like tomorrow that. Tomorrow night, we cross the Great Divide. The what? That line that separates the successes from the also-rans. Tomorrow night, a door will open for us, and we step into the executive suite. Oh? Yes, oh. And that door will be opened by Frederick Tower Baylor, or it won't be open. Darling, I'm it sure... It all depends on you. Now, here's what you have to do. I got this list from Mr. Baylor's secretary this afternoon. Walter, Walter, dear. I was in the midst of... In the of, midst of what? I was talking to these flowers, and now I think your anger has frightened them. Ma Margaret? Ma I mean, Gretchen. Yes? Gretchen, you don't feel well. Oh, no, I feel wonderful. I I've never seen you so... So, so uh, Well, you're usually so sensible. I've never been as sensible as I am at this very moment. All my senses are alive and free. Do, do you think... Should should you see a doctor? Why? Because you're not well. That isn't true. Gretchen, what's wrong? Nothing is wrong. Even if I were ill, which I'm not, what would a doctor do? Prescribe a pill? And what would the pill be made of? From the essences of the very plants and flowers and growing things right here in my very own garden. So you see... All I need to do is just stay here. Now, will you look at this list? Mr. Baylor is a steak and potatoes man. Is he? Dinner should be no problem. Just the steak, french fries, a salad, and ice cream. And he likes the steak rare. Rare? Yes, practically raw, with the blood just about dripping from it. He's very close to the primitive, isn't he? You're Mr. Baylor. Now, look, let's not even joke about it, all right? And furthermore, he isn't my Mr. Baylor. He's our Mr. Baylor. It's our future. My dear... I shall not disgrace you. Well, these past few days, I can't follow things around here. It's the, these flowers and this garden. Yes. And the way you've been talking. Which way is that? I, I don't know, but it isn't your usual way. You're not the same person. Oh, but I am. Oh, no, 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 no. There's something very different about you. Now, please, dear, on this tremendously important night, don't do anything that would spoil Walter, any... Walter, Walter, I don't like the look on your face. What are you talking that about? That look. No human being should appear that troubled. Well, it's important. How many times do I have to remind you? Nothing in this life should be that important. You look as if you... As if you could kill somebody. Well, maybe I could. 
After all, if you're out to make it in this company, you have to be a killer. Walter. I don't mean you have to commit murder exactly, but you have to step on people and, if necessary, destroy them. Eliminate them as rivals. Well, that's committing a kind of murder. Well, look, look, why are we standing around here and talking about it? Have you destroyed many people on your way, Walter? Oh, now, what kind of a question is that? Have you? I suppose I've sidelined a few in my time. Walter. Well, it was them or me. Now, come on, this whole conversation is out of place. Now, about tomorrow night... Walter, my dear... I shall not disgrace you. Margaret, we're here. Well, Walter, it's a nice-looking place you have here. Yes, indeed. The little woman is certainly a lady of good taste. Oh, thank you. Well... Good evening. Dear, I, I would like to uh, present uh, Mr. Baylor, who, who is uh, executive vice president. How do you do, Mr. Baylor? Uh, uh, hello. Uh, mm. Do you like my gown? It was worn by the ancient Greek women, especially on festive occasions. But we, uh, we, uh, did, did you uh, prepare a picture of, of uh, Martini's darling? No, my dear. We shall have wine later. Wine? Oh, yes. Wine made with honey. The ancients called it mead. It's delicious. Well, yes, but darling... And we shall have a most wonderful supper. A meal that would be enjoyed by the gods themselves. Goat's milk and cheese. Bread and fruits. And dates and nuts. But darling, I told you that Mr. Baylor... But that will come later. First, I have prepared a bath for Mr. Baylor. You... What? Uh, dear. Well, dear. you bathe, don't you, Mr. Bailey? Well, I... I... One I, must separate himself from the cares of the day before one can enjoy the delights of the evening. And so you must wash away. I, I don't believe this. Uh, dear, I, I Now, really Mr. Think... Bailey, we'll use the main bath, and Walter, dear, yours is waiting for you in the guest room. And now, if you'll excuse me for just a moment, I shall make sure your bath water is properly scented. The pitcher of goat's milk is there on the sideboard. It's ice cold and delicious. Walter, sir, I... I really don't know what to say. Is this your idea of a joke? Now, Mr. Baylor, please believe me. Because if it is, I'm not amused. Mr. Baylor, I, I really don't know what to say. That, that, that ridiculous costume and, and goat's milk and cheese. Well, there must and... be some mistake. I'll, I'll straighten it out. Well, this is exactly what I have to guard against. I thought Caraway was married to a, a cook, but yours... Well, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Well, well you should be. Uh, m m Mr. Baylor, Mr. Baylor, where are you going? Where do you think I'm going? Home. But don't you say she's been ill? She's been, yes, that's it. She hasn't been feeling well lately, uh, sir. Really? You'd never know it to look at her. Good night. Now, Mr. Mr. Baylor. Mr. Well, whatever became of Mr. Baylor? Whatever became of Mr. Baylor? Do you mean you have to ask? Where did he go? His bath is ready. Yes, I'm sure it is. Have some milk. Here, drink it. You'll feel much better. Walter, why did you do that? Margaret, do you know what you did to me? I don't like that do name. you know what you did to me? You destroyed me. Now, please tell me why. Why? Why did you destroy me? But I didn't. Tell me why. We've been married 15 years. I thought we loved each other. I don't know of any reason you would have to hate me. Now, why? Why did you suddenly destroy me? <laughs> How many marriages are there like this? A man works hard with a single-minded dedication to getting ahead in his company. His wife sits at home, gardens, does some club work, but mainly and mostly she waits for him. The big thing in their lives is the job, the career, the company. I suppose the answer is there are many marriages like this. Even the best of machinery breaks under stress. And human beings are not the most perfect machines. We'll see what repairs, if any, can be effected when I shall return with Act Three. Overnight low near 38. The high for Saturday, 38 degrees under partly cloudy skies. 
There's a man who shares your bed, your board, just as you share his. You share a bank account, automobiles, a house, a boat, a place in the community. And then one day it becomes clear to you that you don't, well, you don't share each other. That is, you share things, but you really don't know each other. As a matter of fact, you're strangers. You've been married for 15 years, and you're strangers. I don't want to discuss what happened here this evening. But what did happen? You deliberately ruined whatever chance I had to become assistant general sales manager. Well, if you have the ability, how could I have ruined your chance? Because in this company, ability isn't everything. Well, then in that case, quit. And take a job in an outfit where it is. Oh, you just don't understand. And I don't have time to explain it, but you're ill. No, I've never felt better. What you did tonight, was that the action of a rational woman? I think so. Would you do something for me? See a doctor. Why? Oh, Margaret. See, that's what's wrong with me. You call me Margaret. Well, that's just for Mr. Baylor's benefit. Well, he isn't here now. And why should I give up my identity for the sake of your boss? Isn't it bad enough that you gave up yours? Margaret, what's gotten into you all of a sudden? Now, you never spoke this way before. You were always so reasonable, so cooperative. Now, what is it? Oh, poor Walter. Don't take that tone with me. Now, Mark, Gretchen, listen, will you help me? I'm trying to help you. Come on, let's walk in the garden. Oh, let's enjoy the beautiful growing things. Gretchen, I want you to see a doctor. No. Please, please, do it for me. There is something wrong with you. Are you aware of the things you said to Mr. Baylor? Darling, we live according to certain rules. I know. And I don't like those rules anymore. Gretchen. Gretchen, you're different. And, and, and I'm scared. Now just see a doctor, huh? And... But I told you, Walter... There's nothing wrong with me. Well, just let me hear the doctor say so. And I promise you, I'll abide by his decision. Mr. Baylor? Yes? May I come in, sir? I am busy. This won't take a moment. Mr. Baylor, I want you to give me another chance. I think the matter is closed, Walter. You know I'm the best qualified man in the company. Not in all respects, Walter. I'm sorry. She was ill. I'm sorry to hear that. She's being treated for it. I said I was sorry. Well, this business we're in, it isn't easy and it takes its toll. That's why it takes a special kind of man who has the support of a special kind of wife. Well, she's worked hard. And, and she's tried hard all these years with me. And I guess, I guess the strain was just too much. Walter... I don't think I can see my way clear. Please, sir, let's give her another chance. Better that this thing should happen now rather than later. We can nip it in the bud. She'll be all right, I promise. Well... In a few weeks, she'll be just fine. You'll see. Well, I, I'll think about it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And he said his name was Dionysus? Yes, Dr. Marks. And don't tell me he didn't appear. If you say he was there, he was there for you. Uh, why should the name Dionysus occur to you? Where did you ever hear it before? Well, I suppose in college, in the study of mythology. And that was years ago. I never even thought of it. But you absorbed it. And you now have the classic conflict between Apollo, who represents duty, and Dionysus, who is desire. But I never... All people face this battle... In some, it rages with more fire. In some, the flames are banked. But in no one is it ever dormant. But the garden, the flowers and plants, and the growing things, how do you account for them? Well, there's a reasonable, rational explanation of sudden coming together in one spot of wind, water, soil. But this garden, he said, and I know, it's the fruit of love. Our love. I sit there among the blossoms and I know he's with me. He's talking to me. My dear Gretchen, you'll learn better in the winter. What about the winter? In the winter, the garden will die. And so will this dream. <laughs> Yes, yes, my love, yes, I hear you. 
Yes, I see you. Gretchen, Gretchen. What? Oh, Porter, you startled me. Oh, is this your secret? Do you, do you talk to your flowers? Of course. I, I just can't understand this garden. It grows more beautiful every day. Yes. Come on now, Gretchen, what's the secret? Uh, it's a garden of love. For sure, but how, how does it work? It's the love of two people. Okay, I won't ask. I'm satisfied just to enjoy it. I do have a confession to make. I was so wild with envy that I came in here the other night and I stole a small rose bush. But you could have asked me for it. I planted it in my garden and and the next morning it, it was dead. Oh, I was careful. I, I handled it gently. I, I watered it and fed it. But it died. It withered completely. As if it had died a, a long time ago. Perhaps it did. Gretchen, what's come over you? You seem so different, so... Yes? Well, you always struck me as a... Well... Well, I'll say it. A, a very quiet little person. And, and now you... You glow all over. I feel there's a glow inside me. Ah, oh, Gretchen, it's beautiful. But I see now it's a... It's a, an awful beauty. It, it's a frightening beauty. Fear and terror. It's all part of beauty. Those crimson flowers. That, that red. It's like the red of blood. These flowers, they look as if they're being nourished with blood. They are, Porter. They are. How did you know? How, how did, 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 did I know? Well, I... Uh, <clears throat> well, uh, uh, good night, Gretchen. Uh, good night. <laughs> Hello? Gretchen, it's four o'clock. I called to check. On what, Walter? Oh. What, you have an appointment? Did you forget? No. Then what are you doing at home? I don't care to go. Now, what do you say? Well, why should I go? I'm not the one who's sick. Mr. Baylor is giving us another chance. Oh, Mr. Baylor, what an unfortunate man. He should spend more time with growing things. Bring him home with you tonight. I'm on my way right now, this minute. Now, don't you go anywhere. Why, Walter... Where would I go? Drink this, Walter. You'll feel better. Darling, I spoke to Dr. Morix. There is something wrong with you. Now, why don't you help yourself? There's nothing wrong, dear. How can you say there's nothing... I feel alive, Walter. All of me. Every part of me. Come to the garden with me, Walter. You live, you love, like a god. Yeah, something's come over you. Don't ask me what, but a week ago, something happened. Yes. Something happened. You changed. Well, I can hardly believe you're Gretchen, my wife. I'm Gretchen. You had sense. You, you had a knowledge of, of life. Well, you and I, we worked together toward a goal. Yes, dear. But I found a better goal. You did? What? Love. Love? That was the secret. The secret of the ancient gods. Now, Gretchen, I'm going to drag you to the doctor. Oh, if you must fight, fight like a man with your hands. I despise you. Now, what has happened? You can't just suddenly tear down our life. What's wrong with what I'm doing? Why shouldn't I work for the Baylor Corporation? Because it's a house for slaves. Well, it's my job. We agreed. You never objected. It, it bought us this house and the cars. And turned us into fawning, simpering, terrified slaves. Okay, okay. Everybody in the world is a slave to something. That's what life is. You give to get. Yes. Everyone is a slave. But I have been freed. What do you mean, freed? By whom? By my lover. What, what lover? He's in the garden. Now, Gretchen, Gretchen, you come back here. If you want me, fight for me. Fight him for me. Oh, love. Oh, love, stay with me. Don't let anyone keep us apart. Gretchen, Gretchen, who are you talking to? My lover. Don't you see him? You mean there's another guy, someone else? Someone else who gives me what I need. Who? Who? He's a god. Who is he? I told who? you. Oh. 
Choke it out of you. He's a god. Who is the guy? Walter, you're choking me. Who? Who's the guy? You're choking me. Hello, Porter. Hello, Walter. Just dropped by to see if there's any news of Gretchen. No. Well, keep your chin up, fella. Maybe she'll come back. Yes, I hope so. Did you two have a fight? Well, it was, uh, more of a misunderstanding. Oh, I'm sorry. Have you notified anyone? Well, I reported it to the police, but, uh... Oh, and Dr. Marks said that she must have wandered off. Funny. Funny how the garden, that, that beautiful garden, just withered without her. Yeah. <laughs> she was right. She said it was the fruit of love. Without her love, it just... Yeah, yeah. Well, I... I just don't want to take up too much more of your time. No, no, it's all right, I wish I could figure out why those luxuriant plants grew so suddenly and just as suddenly they died. Well, uh, you know what Dr. Mark said. Uh, sudden coming together of sun and rain, soil, water. Yeah, that's right. She's an inscrutable gal, that Mother Nature. Yes. We'll never know. I guess not. Well, uh, this is a good chance for me to say goodbye. I'm off on a trip. Oh? Yes, I, uh... Made general sales manager. Oh. Finally, yes. Poor Gretchen. Came too late for her. How she wanted it. How she would have enjoyed it. Well, uh... Say goodbye to June for me, huh? Okay, well, I will. Walter, hmm? is it my imagination? What? The garden. What about it? Those plants... That bit. Well, that, that color, that crimson color, that the scarlet color. Look. Why, that, that looks... That's, that's blood. Blood. Oh, you, you're crazy. It's just color. Am I? But, but just look, blood on, on all the withered blossoms, fresh, bright blood all over the garden. Great Gretchen. Gretchen, what do you mean, Gretchen? It can't, it can't be her blood. It can't be. Well, whoever said it, it was. Can't, it can't be because, because, because there was no blood. What do you, what do you mean there was no blood? When I killed her, there was no blood. She fell. She fell. You see, and 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 she struck her head hard against the tree, but there was no blood. Walter, do you know what you're saying? I can prove it. Pick her up. You'll see. There is no blood. No blood. Well, there was some in the garden, in the beautiful garden of Gretchen and Dionysus. And the garden is no unusual garden, for all flowers have something in them of the one who plants them and watches and waters and nurses and loves them. I'll be back shortly. The struggle, the never-ending struggle between Apollo and Dionysus, between duty and pleasure, between what we want and what we must settle for, is fought inside each of us. And sometimes it's Apollo who conquers, and sometimes Dionysus. Happy, however, is he or she where neither has conquered, but where both spirits can live side by side in peace and quiet. But too much quiet gets boring after a bit. So uh, make sure we disturb yours tomorrow. Our cast included Mercedes McCambridge, Larry Haynes, Robert Maxwell, and Gil Mack. The 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Somehow, in a manner yet to be determined, Mr. George Rivers was killed. Arrest me, Lieutenant. Arrest you? Why? I am guilty. Of what? Murder. Murder? Yes. I killed George Rivers. Mr. Paradine, at this point, I must advise you of your rights under the law. Lieutenant, I committed the deed. I shall pay the price. How did you murder George Rivers? In drama as in life, there is the inevitable. And so, my artistry, my creativity could produce only the inevitable result. The death of Hamilton. My concern is the death of George Rivers. I know, I know. But at that time, and in that place, they were one and the same. How did you murder George? George River. I told you. What did you tell me? He died as a testimony to the truth. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises, the politicians wearing blue have different promises, but those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. This is Boris Karloff speaking. I'm here with a story for you from the files of the Reader's Digest. Who killed Chung Ling Su? The coroner's verdict was death by misadventure, but the fate of magician Chung Ling Su was almost certainly no accident. The strange story begins in New York 60 years ago. A certain William Ellsworth Robinson, a magician by profession, was broke. Far less skillful men than he were getting all the jobs, and Robinson decided to try a desperate gamble. And so, in May 1900, a glittering-eyed man with a queue and flowing oriental raiment registered at a fashionable hotel in London. And with him, there travelled a diminutive, slant-eyed maiden. They called themselves the illustrious Chu Ling Su and his assistant Susie Seen. But, back home in America, they'd just been plain Bill and Dottie Robinson. After just one performance at the famed Alhambra, Chung Ling Su's success was assured. 
things went fine for a time. Then into the pretender's paradise came temptation. Her name was Estelle. He was sure that his romance was a secret until one night he found an anonymous note on his dressing room table. Be careful. Don't forget that in your bullet-catching trick, your wife loads the guns. Surely Dottie didn't suspect? Or did she? It wore on his nerves. So he decided on a divorce. He'd marry Estelle and end this worrying. And then, unbelieving, he heard his beloved say, Oh no, Chong, I could never marry anyone but an American. But I am an American, I'll prove it. Next day, dressed in western clothes, he called on Estelle. She stared at him, shocked. What she saw was an undistinguished man, halting and ordinary in speech. Where was the strange, alluring figure from the East? Miserably, Chung Ling Su confided in a friend. It's like having two men in one body, he said. One wants a woman that he can't have, and the other has a woman that he's afraid of. His friend was worried. I wish you wouldn't do the bullet-catching trick tonight, he said. Well, this is the last time I'll ever do it, promised Chung Ling Su, and went out onto the stage. The trick began as always. Four spectators were coaxed up onto the stage. Other audience members were asked to examine the bullets. Then, Dottie Robinson loading the bullets into guns. Then music, Chung giving the sign, fire. The curtain fell and behind it, Robinson lay dead in the arms of the innocent Susie Seen. Houdini made a public statement explaining the gun trick. Normally the bullets never left the guns. The performer carried duplicates in his mouth, but this time the trick mechanism in the guns must have failed to work. But Chung's friend knew that there had been no accident, knew that Chung Ling Su had been slain on that stage by his envious other self, the killer and the victim falling together in one body. The sad but true story of the wizard Chung Ling Su is from the Reader's Digest back files, but it bears a resemblance to an article in the current December issue of the magazine, also about some wizardry. In this case, the subject matter is more cheerful, for the wizardry involves some fabulous automatic devices which will do anything from steering an aeroplane to keeping the snakes in the zoo happy. The name of the article is They're Wizards on Control, and I found it most interesting. I'll be joining you soon again with more transcribed stories, but until next time, this is Boris Karloff saying goodbye. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Mystery Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House.
Barb, I hope tonight's story is good enough to make a bestseller novel. I think it is. Well, let's see now. What's the title again? Sub Rosa Justice. The uh, folks all ready to act it out? Sure, they're out in the game room. I'll go get them. Fine. Well, say, while Mrs. Glenn's rounding up the rest of them, here's something you should hear. <laughs> Okay, places, everybody. Set the scene, will you, Tom? Sub Rosa Justice. Tonight's story opens in a doctor's office. Thorne Carlson is looking at the doctor with amused disfavor. Oh, come now, doctor. You're being too abstract. You're putting on that smug, complacent, professional face. I have tried to be as plain as possible, Mr. Carlson. In cases such as yours, one cannot be specific. One cannot be specific. Well, maybe not, but one can be blunt. Take a chance, Doctor. Tell me something that adds up. All right, Mr. Carlson. You have one month to live. Maybe a little more. Probably somewhat less. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, one month to live. Yeah, that's quite amusing in a way. Oh, don't look so shocked. With an affliction such as yours, Mr. Carlson. That really is funny, Doctor. An affliction such as mine. Do you know why I'm so little disturbed about dying? Because I've lost my affliction. You must be mistaken about that, Mr. Carlson. The x-rays show quite clearly. X-rays? Did you take an x-ray of my soul, Doctor? Or isn't medical science that well developed yet? Oh, pardon me. I'm doing the identical thing I accused you of doing a few minutes ago. I'm being abstract. Perhaps I'd better explain what I mean. Or aren't you interested? But, of course, I am very much interested. Fine. I think I'll enjoy telling someone about everything. It all began when Gretchen and I were married. Goodbye, everybody. We'll be back in three weeks. And and here's a little surprise for all of you. Surprise? Well, what are you talking you about? You see? It's a surprise on Thorn, too. We'll be at home at the old Tinley Mansion. Mother's giving it to us for a wedding present. Gretchen, you knew I'd rented an apartment for us. Uh, why didn't you tell me about the Tinley Mansion? Why, I wanted it to be a surprise, Thorne. And it's a perfectly marvelous one, isn't it? It's our Gretchen, completely out. Hi, Thorne, you're a joke. I can't afford to keep up the place. And besides, I couldn't be happy rattling around in a huge old barn like that. People can afford anything they want. Smart people. And I couldn't be happy in a stuffy little apartment. We'll get along. But I don't make enough money, Gretchen. That place, well, well, it must cost a fortune to keep it going. You're quite right, Thorne, about not making enough money. You don't. And that's one of the first things we're going to change. You must develop contacts. Contacts? Oh, oh. you mean live off my friend's charity? <laughs> that's just the point. Most of your friends couldn't afford any charity. We're going to move up, Thorne, and the Tinley Mansion's going to help us do it. Did it ever occur to you, Gretchen, that I might not want to move up? I'm pretty happy just as I am. You're brilliant, Thorne, but you lack ambition. That's one reason why I'm going to be good for you. <laughs> I can think of some other reasons, Mrs. Carlson. Oh, Thorne, don't, don't get mushy. Our marriage can be a tremendous success if we take advantage of all our weapons. Weapons? Your biggest asset is personal charm. You do have it, darling. And Mother can help us socially, with money, too. You almost scare me, Gretchen. You talk like this was a, a business deal. You married a smart woman, Thorne. I married a lovely one. You don't really know how smart I am. No. Remember when you were running after uh, Diana Tracy? Yes, I remember. Everybody was saying you'd marry her. Gretchen, please. And then she went to New York without even saying goodbye to you. Well, you don't need to rub it in. You never knew why she left, did you? No, I didn't. It was because I told her you and I had been secretly married for six months. What? You see, I know how to get what I want. Everything I want. You you told Diana that? Yes. <laughs> and she fell for it. Uh, uh, Thorne, uh, don't stare at me like that. What's the matter? Nothing. I... I guess you do love me, don't you? Why, why of course, Thorne. Of course I do. Oh, Thorne, you'll have to 
change in a hurry. Guess who's going to be here for dinner tonight? Oh, Gretchen, can't we just for once have some friends in for dinner? Must we be forever selling something? You should know the answer to that. Bills pass due at every store in town. You bet we should be selling. And so on. Well, what now? It's terribly important that you play up to Mrs. Sweet tonight. I can handle her husband, but she'll actually make the decisions. I'm sure of that. So be especially nice and charming to her. There's a word to describe you, Gretchen. Thorn. Get me sore enough and I'll use it sometime. There you have it, Mr. Shannon. What do you think? Well, that's very good, Mrs. Carlson. I, uh, I wish you weren't married. You'd be a great success in the advertising business. I will be anyway, Mr. Shannon. Oh, you mean you'd go to work for my agency? No, but my husband will, and I'll press the buttons. I'll be working for you almost as if I had an office here. <laughs> I don't doubt it a bit. Uh, what's your proposition? You have a fine agency. Your trouble is that you don't have enough good prospective clients. You're too cold-blooded a businessman. Cold-blooded? Well, uh, go on. My husband's a business fool, but he has charm and social position. He has the things you need. I sell on the merits of my product. Oh, nonsense. You need what Thorne could give you, and you know it. Well, what does Mr. Carlson think about all this? He's an architect, isn't he? Well, I haven't even consulted him yet. But he'll come into your agency if I tell him to. There's just one catch to it, Mr. Shannon. Yes? What's that? He'll cost you a half interest in your agency. Hello, Gretchen. Oh, you're looking beautiful tonight. I have two surprises for you, Thorne. What have you done now? But what do you mean? I've learned to distrust your surprises, Gretchen. You have the nerve to say that. Haven't they always worked out for the best? Haven't I brought you right up the ladder? All right, what now? First, we're going to have a baby. Huh? Oh, that's wonderful, darling. Oh, just a minute. Second, you're through with architecture. Huh? The arrangements are all made, and I drove a hard bargain. You're going into an advertising agency. <laughs> Can you help me with my arithmetic? Why, sure, Topsy. Thorne, I wish you wouldn't call the child by that ridiculous nickname. Other children in the neighborhood are beginning to pick it up. Oh, but I like being called Topsy, Mother. Well, you shouldn't. Mother, why is it that the things I really and truly like are, are always the things I shouldn't like? I suppose that's because you take after your father, dear. Oh, for heaven's sake, Gretchen. You don't have to let the child... Let her know the facts of life? You're quite wrong, Thorne. Won't you help me with my arithmetic, Daddy? Sure, Topsy. You know, uh, we've got to get E.E. E. Cummings' book of poetry, uh, Is Five. Is Five? Uh-huh. What does that mean? Well, you see, Topsy, a lot of uh, stuffy grown-ups have made a lot of rules. And because they've made those rules, certain things are so. And the rules say that uh, two and two are four. Well, aren't they? Mm, for most people, yes, Topsy. But not for you and me. You see, Topsy, you and I are among the privileged few. And just because some old sour-faced schoolmaster's made a rule, you and I don't have to believe it. Well, what do we believe then, Daddy? Well, uh, we think that uh, quite possibly, under the right circumstances, uh, two and two aren't four at all. No, or maybe when the moon's in the right phase, two and two's five. Thorne, I won't have it, you hear? I work to keep her from being an impractical fool, and you tear down everything I do. Not quite everything, I'm afraid, Gretchen. But I try hard. Oh, are we expecting guests this evening? Only Bob Shannon. I asked him over. Run on up to bed, Dorothy. I'll take you, Topsy. The child's quite capable of going to bed by herself. Come on, Topsy. Last one up the stairs is the purple pink bamboo. Oh, Bob. Come in. Hi, Gretchen. Why the command summons? I thought there were some things we should discuss. Ah, Gretchen, you know I love this house. It's so cool and efficient looking. Uh, Where's Thorne? He went upstairs to put Dorothy to bed. He'll be down in a minute. He's a swell guy, Gretchen. You did me a big favor that day that you came in and sold him down the river. I don't do favors. A business deal is mutually advantageous. I've never been able to figure you out, Gretchen. You make the Mona Lisa look like an open book. (laughs) Nonsense. Were you ever in love with Thorne? I mean, before you married him? Well, of course. I saw great possibilities in him. Uh, 
I'm glad you never fell in love with me, Gretchen. Oh, I don't know. I could have done a great deal for you, Bob. Actually, you'd have been much better material than Thorne. Did I hear my name? Uh, hi, Bob. Oh, hi, Thorne. We were uh, just admiring Gretchen's handiwork. Uh, sit down, Thorne. Oh, why so solemn? I have a little surprise for you men. Oh, watch out, Bob. You don't know her surprises like I do. <laughs> I've been checking the firm's books. Well, we've come a long ways in the last nine years, haven't we? I checked them myself the other day. Yes. Yes, we've come a long ways. And nearly 80% of the billing is Thorne. Sure, I get it, and Bob takes care of it. Not a bad deal. Hmm. Not a bad deal for Bob. Huh? What do you mean? I mean that, well, frankly, you're not carrying your share of the load, Bob. You aren't contributing as much as we are. No? What are you going to do about it? Thorne's pulling out of the agency. He's moving over to Modern as a senior partner. Thorne, you do that to me. Well, this is a complete surprise to me, Bob. I I've have made any... all the arrangements. Thorne's clients have agreed to the change. But you can't do that to me, Gretchen. You'd tear down overnight all that I've been years building up. Well, it's more than a business to me. It's, it's everything I have in the world. It's my life. Don't worry, Bob. I won't do it. You won't have anything to say about it, Thorne. You see, I knew you'd be swayed by sentiment, so uh, I got your clients to approve the change. I started Thorne out in the business. We're partners. You never gave us anything we didn't earn. It was always business. And it's still business. Goodbye, Gretchen. Thorn, where are you going? Out. I may be back and I may not. He means it, Gretchen. Your plan won't work. <laughs> He'll be back. You're forgetting Dorothy. Yes, Dorothy. Poor little kid. Poor, poor little kid. I think I'm going to do her a favor. A great favor. Gretchen. Oh, Gretchen! <gasps> Great Scott. No! You woke me up, Daddy. You shouldn't shout so... Oh, oh Mother. Daddy, something's happened. Mother's hurt. No, no, not hurt, Topsy. Your mother's dead. She's been strangled to death with a handkerchief. No. She can't be dead. She can't be. Mother, speak to me. Please, Mother, say something. Topsy, honey. Sometimes things happen that little girls can't understand. Maybe later and maybe never. You'll have to be a brave kid. Now, go on back to bed, honey. Untie the handkerchief from around your neck, Daddy. It's so tight. All right, darling. Daddy, what are you doing with the handkerchief? I'm going to put it in my pocket, Topsy. Oh, but it belongs to whoever killed my mother. It's a man's handkerchief. A man with the initial S. It must be Mr. Stanton. He was coming here when I went to bed. Topsy, no, you mustn't say that. Don't ever mention it. Your mother was killed by a man while I was gone. People say bad things about that, honey. Bad things about your mother. This is our secret. Promise, honey. All right, Daddy. It's our secret. <laughs> to be murders, I'm all in favor of having them happen to people like Gretchen. And now, we go back to the living room of Thorne Carlson's home. The twisted body of Gretchen Carlson is still on the floor behind the piano. The police have just arrived on the scene. I'm sleepy, Daddy. And I'm scared. I want to go to Grandma's. In just a little while, lads. You can go to your Grandma's. Maybe I'll take you in a squad car. Wouldn't that be fun? Topsy, uh, this is Mr. Dolan. He's from the police. How do you do, Mr. Dolan? How do you do? So your name's Topsy, huh? <laughs> That's cute. Oh, it's not my real name. Mother got off from the ad when Daddy called me Topsy. But I liked it. So your mother got mad, huh? At your daddy? Yes. She didn't like the way daddy always jokes and teases. I I guess she was sort of mad at him a lot. Topsy. 
Didn't your daddy ever get mad at your mother? Oh, no. He just looked sad when she scolded him. Kind of like he'd fallen and hurt his knee. Dolan, this can't go on. You've got to stop it. Maybe you could stop it, Dolan. Me how? By signing a confession, Mr. Carlson. A confession to your wife's murder. Well, now that you've learned that Gretchen and I had our quarrels, what next? I figured that was kind of up to you. What do you mean? A man has a quarrel with his wife. The wife is murdered. But I tell you, I wasn't even here when she was murdered. Sure, you tell me that. I wasn't mad tonight. I was just uh, disgusted. So disgusted that I walked out on them. Them? You hadn't said anything about anyone else. You said you and your wife were alone. I... We were. When a woman gets murdered, there's a reason. Either you're lying about you and her being alone, or you killed her. No, no, that's not true. You had a motive. You hated your wife. You fought with her. You had the opportunity. You were alone with her tonight. Stop it. Don't you have any feelings at all? I'll get it. Hello? Oh, Newton. What? Well, I'll be darned. You don't tell me. (laughs) That just goes to show you never know, doesn't it? Okay, thanks, Newton. I'll see you later. Goodbye. What was that? Never mind. Are you ready to sign a confession? No. You'll hang, Carlson. You'll get a rope around your neck just as tight as the one you tied around your wife's neck. It wasn't a rope. Oh, so it wasn't a rope. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Come on, you might as well come clean, Carlson. You'll spill the whole work sooner or later. No, listen, you can't talk to my daddy like that. Stop it. You're a bad man and I hate you. Besides, you don't know what you're talking about. Stop it. I thought you were in bed. I was sitting at the top of the stairs listening. Hang it, Dolan. You can't torture the youngster this way. So I don't know what I'm talking about, huh, Topsy? No. Topsy, please. But I'm sure I do know what I'm talking about, Topsy. But it wasn't a rope at all, just like Daddy says. He was telling you the truth. Then what was it? Pops, for the love of it Mike. It was a handkerchief, that's what it was. A man's handkerchief, wasn't it, Daddy? Honey, honey, please go on back up to bed. You shouldn't be down here. So it was a man's handkerchief. And uh, what happened to it? Daddy stuck in his pocket. That pocket right there. I'll remember that, Dolan. And your Daddy put it in his pocket because he didn't want anybody to know it was his. Is that right? Oh, but it wasn't his, Mr. Dolan. It wasn't Daddy's at all. It was Mr. Shannon's. Daddy said I mustn't tell, but but you won't tell anybody, will you? Hand it over, Carlson. I won't do it. You can't thank me. This isn't a game, Carlson. This is a murder I'm investigating, a cold-blooded murder. And I think I can make you. Now, give it here. Uh, all right. Here. Hmm. I'll twist it. I can see where there's been some hard knots tied in it. Initial letter S in the corner. You'll be sorry for this, Dolan. Did your daddy say why you mustn't tell anybody about the handkerchief, Topsy? Yes. He said something about my mother being killed by a man while he wasn't here. And and something about people talking there. He said maybe someday I might understand. Oh, I see. You're quite a guy, Carlson. I'd like to shake your hand. What for? You take a murder rap to protect your wife's name. But Shannon didn't kill her. Shannon wouldn't do a thing like that. Was Shannon here when you left the house this evening? I... No. No, he wasn't. Why, Daddy, that was a whopper. He was. You know he was. Thanks, Topsy. Now you can go up and go to sleep. And you won't talk bad to my Daddy anymore? No. I won't talk bad to your Daddy. I think I'll talk kind of respectful to him. Good night. Good night. Good night, Daddy. Good night, dear. It was all right for me to tell Mr. Dolan our secret, wasn't it? Yes, honey. I I guess it was all right. You probably won't believe this, Mr. Carlson, but I already knew Shannon was the murderer anyway. All I had to do was bust somebody enough to get the truth. So you picked on a child? Yes, I suppose you could say that. But I don't think I did wrong. Murder is something I've seen a lot of, but it still gets under my skin. Every time is just as bad as the time before. You didn't know it was Shannon. You couldn't know. You're bluffing. No, I'm not bluffing. Remember that telephone call I got from the station? The one you were so curious about? Yes. Your partner, Mr. Shannon, tried to commit suicide tonight just a little while ago. Turned on the gas in his apartment. He's dead? No, he didn't get off that easy. He'll pay the full price for this. He'll suffer a lot more than inhaling gas. You can have ten minutes with him, Mr. Carlson. I'll tell you when your time's up. All right. I'm sorry, Bob. Dreadfully sorry. Ah, you ought to hate me, Thorne. Yet you're the only friend I have. 
The only one who tried to save me. Didn't do any good. You tried, Thorne. You're not guilty, Bob. Even if the jury said you were, I know that. Oh, I'm afraid I am guilty, Thorne. I remember saying to Gretchen something about Topsy. I said, I'm going to do her a favor. And then Gretchen laughed at me and I slapped her face. Everything went black and the next thing I remember, I was in the hospital. They didn't believe me when I told them that, Thorne. I don't suppose I'd believe it if I were on the jury. I believe you, Bob. There's still a chance. The governor... No, no. It's better this way. Our business is gone now. You know that. Everything I worked for all my life. Gretchen had her way, Thorne. I'd have lost it if she'd have lived. Her death took it away from me anyway. She was the most evil woman I ever knew. I... I'd gladly trade places with you, Bob. No, no. I thought about that, Thorne. About trying to throw suspicion on you, but that was no good. Why not? There's Topsy. Yes, there's Topsy. Higher. I don't regret a thing, Thorne. I've no relatives, nobody to humiliate. And I've done the kid just what I said I would. I've done her a favor. So waste no tears, Thorne. It's a good job all around. Just forget about the governor. No dramatics, no scenes. Your ten minutes is up, Mr. Carlson. Thank you, Dolan. That's the story, Doctor. When I said I could laugh at death because I had lost my affliction, you see what I mean. But you have undergone a terrible shock, Mr. Carlson. It's no wonder. Shock, Doctor? Yes, I suppose I have. But there's something extremely amusing about the whole thing. Amusing? My dear Mr. Carlson... You see, Shannon was telling the truth, Doctor. What? He didn't know what happened after he struck Gretchen. I found him wandering about the streets, incoherent. I took him to his apartment and turned on the gas. Then I went home and strangled Gretchen. I killed her. You? You murdered your wife? Certainly. I was willing to pay for my wife's murder, but there was Topsy. She couldn't go through life with the world thinking her father a murderer. Shannon had nothing to live for with the business gone anyway, but I'd have taken his place in a second if it hadn't been for the youngster. Well, I hardly know what to say, Mr. Carlson. Oh, you don't need to say anything. I got justice for Gretchen without ever resorting to the law, and, well, with one month to live, it looks like somebody, something, got justice for me the same way. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Who I said to myself? He's a genius. What the theater needs is a good old-fashioned melodrama. He's a genius. The public is tired of symbolic plays where people He's sit a in a sewer for three acts contemplating their navels. He's a genius. Lou, I said to myself, get yourself a real melodrama with a pretty innocent a young genius. girl and a deep-dyed villain. I tried to get He's the top playwrights to give me a melodrama. He's a genius. I got stacks of unread manuscripts by unknown writers. He's a genius. Then I found it. The play I was looking for. I entitled it He's Melodrama, and now Melodrama is the biggest hit on Broadway. He's a genius. The biggest hit of the season, the biggest hit in years. It's He's making a me a million dollars. He's a genius. Lou, I said to myself, you're a genius. <laughs> Five, 
Live presents Melodrama. Thanks for calling, Johnny. No, I haven't found a play yet. Spread the word around that I want a real melodrama. I tell you what, I'm just leaving the office now. I'll meet you at the backstage club in 15 minutes. Hello, Mr. Darren. You're not the type. You're assuming I'm an actress. Who else comes into a producer's office, especially without knocking? Write your name down and don't call us. We'll call you. Well, have I asked you for a job? What else would you want? Uh, plenty. No, now, look, it'll take a few minutes to explain. It might even take a long time. No, it won't, because I won't listen. I have to leave now. Oh, look, you're looking for melodrama, aren't you? Uh-huh, and I don't expect to get it from any actress. Oh, oh how do I say it? Mr. Darren, I I'm desperate. Oh, I know you're used to having people say they're desperate. I know it isn't a good approach, but look, Mr. Darren, when was the last time an actress came into this office not looking for a job? Young lady, are you trying to pry into my private life? I am deadly serious, Mr. Darren. I, I want a favor, yes, but I'm not looking for a job. Please, please listen to me. What favor? Give me five minutes. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to light this cigarette now, and you have until it's finished to tell me what's on your mind. All right. Oh, my goodness, I'd better talk fast. I in the first place, I'm not from New York. Actresses never are. I come from a little town upstate. I was the leading lady in the high school dramatic club, and everybody said I was good. Every leading lady in every high school dramatic club is good until she leaves home. I wish you'd stop talking and using up my time. Well, I started acting with a little theater group. A professional critic from Rochester said I was absolutely wonderful as Tina. You know, the girl who sucks her thumb throughout the two acts of Hope is a Crumpled Newspaper Blown by Vagrant Winds. All right. Four months ago, my uncle's estate was settled, and I got $3,500. So you came to New York to play Ophelia. So I came to New York to play anything I could get. <laughs> but it wasn't easy. I tramped around from one producer's office to another, and I never heard a casting director say anything except, you're not the type. Everybody talks about how actresses have aching hearts, and what we really have is aching feet. Two more puffs, and I'll kill this cigarette. Oh, well, here, uh... Have one of mine. <laughs> All right. One more cigarette just because you're pretty. Fine. And for heaven's sake, Mr. Darren, don't puff so hard. <laughs> what I want to tell you about is something that started one day in the corridor right outside this office. I'd been waiting to see you for three hours, Mr. Darren, and finally I left. Well, a man who was also been waiting caught up with me in the corridor. He was tall and tailored, and he had blue eyes and light hair and a sandy mustache. And, well, naturally, I believed him when he said he was an actor because he had an English accent. I beg your pardon, miss. Oh. Yes? I gather we're fellow thespians. I'm looking for a job as an actress, if that's what you mean. I gather that. You may have wondered why I was hanging about so long in Lou Darren's office. I suppose you were looking for a job just like me. Oh, my goodness, now. Lou and I are old friends. Perhaps it isn't modest, but it's a simple statement of fact that I don't have to beg for jobs in the theater. As a matter of fact, I'm Dick Appleton. Oh. Is that so? Yes. And to tell you the truth, I was studying you there in Lou's office. I believe you may be exactly the type I'm looking for. For what? For lunch, to start with. Mr. Appleton, I'm not in the house. Oh, please, I don't want you to misconstrue my motives. Fact is, I'm engaged in a theatrical venture. That's all I can tell you now. But if we have lunch together, we talk together for an hour or so, I'll know by the end of that time whether you're the young, fresh talent that I'm looking for. You mean to act on the stage? Exactly. Lunch. Lunch? <laughs> lunch. And I found Dick Appleton very easy to talk to. Mostly because what we talked about was me. But by the end of the lunch, I still had no inkling as to whether he was pleased with me or not. All the coffee, though. Well, you are an interesting person, Miss Biddle. What I don't see is how you manage to live here in New York. Well, I do have a little money. Oh? Yes, but it's discouraging when no producer seems to take me seriously. Yes, of course. Uh, I don't suppose you have much money. Mm, 
my uncle left me $3,500. You know, I was wondering whether I ought to go to a dramatic school. Oh, I doubt that you need to. $3,500, you said? Mm-hmm. Well, I don't suppose there's much of that left. Oh, about $2,500. Ah, $2,500. Then you can sustain yourself during the rehearsal period. Would you say that again? Oh, it's sorry, my dear girl. Here we are. I've been talking for an hour, and it's obvious to me that you're enormously talented. Golly. You have incandescence. Oh, I've seen that word in drama reviews. And luminosity. I have? Indeed, you certainly have. Now, let's get down to business. I'm associated in the production of a new play by... Well, I'm not at liberty to say who the playwright is oh, yet. Of course. But he is one of our really fine modern playwrights. The play is symbolic. It's all about a girl surrounded with abnormal uncles and aunts, cousins and brothers and sisters, though, who runs away to find sanity by living in a sandbox. Oh, oh, the sandbox is symbolic. I knew you had a quick mind. And the writing itself, stark, almost incoherent. Oh, it sounds wonderful. Oh, it is. I'm sure it'll run two years. Now, then, I want you to play the girl. The lead? The lead. But I don't want to unveil you to my associates until I've coached you for some time. Oh, I'll do anything you say. Splendid. Now, I have a small apartment here in the city. I live in Bucks County, actually. Now, if you'd come to that apartment each day... Starting when? Starting now. Let's go. For two weeks, I rehearsed in that apartment. Mr. Darren, you have no idea how exciting and demanding he was. Where sometimes he'd have me read one line over and over again, different ways for an hour. Oh, he seemed to know an awful lot about acting. Wait a minute, my cigarette's out. I, I know, I noticed. But I hope you're going to listen to the rest of it. I am, yes, and I'll tell you why. This man said he was a good friend of mine. Yes? I don't know anybody named Dick Appleton. I'm not surprised. He acted as if he were well-known in the theater. I can say with authority that there's no Dick Appleton in the theater. I'm not surprised at that either. Who was this guy? Will I go on? Yes. Well, as I said, he rehearsed me hard for two weeks. He criticized my walk, corrected my diction, told me that all my life I had been sitting down and standing up without really knowing how to do these things. Well, then one day when I arrived at the apartment... Oh... Hello, Mary. Good morning. Uh, come in, won't you? All right. Well, shall we start? Uh, ready, Mary. I don't know. What's the matter? I just don't know how to tell you this. Oh, dear, something's terribly wrong. It certainly is. Yet I've made you put in your time here for two weeks. Really, I feel I ought to pay you for it. I don't understand. You know what an angel is, of course. Oh, sure. The backer of a play. The man who puts up the money. Well, that's one way of saying it. My way of saying it this morning is that an angel is a devil. Well, I, I think you'd better explain. Uh, sit down, won't you? All right. Now, naturally, I have a backer for this play we've been rehearsing. I've put in a good deal of my own money, but I did need the backer's money, too. Now, the playwright trusts me implicitly. And when I told him about you, he said he'd take my word for your talent. But... The backer. I see. The backer doesn't want me? The backer insists on a big-name star. Oh, dear. Either I agree to cast a star, in which case you don't get the part, or I insist on you, in which case the play doesn't go on. There isn't any other way of getting the money? Not quickly enough, no. Oh, wait a minute. If I sold my telephone company, she... I know. But it'd almost make it, but we'd still need another $2,000. Oh. 2000 But I have $2,000. Oh, no, 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 Mary. I couldn't take it. Look, money. there isn't anything wrong with an actress investing in a play, is there? Well, no. It's done all the time, of course. Especially when the actress is going to star in the play. Well, then... No, Mary, I hate to do But don't you see? You're doing me a favor. Well... Look, when do you need the money? Well, as a matter of fact, yeah, right away. I have to put a deposit down right, for the right, theater. Right. Now, you stay right there. I'm going to go down to the bank. And I'll be back in 15 minutes with $2,000. I ran all the way to the bank. And then all the way back. And when I gave Dick Appleton the $2,000, it was wonderful to see how happy he was. Oh, wonderful, Mary. Let me kiss you. Mm. 
No rehearsing today, Mary. Go on home, take a nap, and dream about opening night. He didn't have to tell me to dream about opening night. I did nothing else from then until the next morning when I returned to his apartment. I knew, or at any rate I thought, that yesterday he had put down the deposit on the theater. Oh, I was so excited. I was an actress. I was going to be a star. Well, when he didn't answer my knock, I tried the door. It opened. So I, I walked in. The apartment was vacant. All the furniture was gone. Dick Appleton was gone. And my money was gone. Well, Miss Biddle, that's a very interesting story, but I don't see what it has to do with me. Mr. Darren, the story is not finished yet. You said you were going to ask me a favor. That's right. What is it? Well, you'll have to hear the whole story first. I'm overdue at the backstage club. You haven't been interested in what I've been telling you? I've been very much interested. But when somebody wants a favor and tells me a long story, finally ending with the information that her money is gone, I get suspicious. Ah, uh-huh. you're afraid I'm going to ask you for money. That's exactly what I'm afraid of. Well, I won't keep you in suspense about that. I am going to ask you for money. It's time for me to leave for the backstage. No, no, the rest of the story doesn't take long. And I can assure you that you're going to want to give me money when I'm finished. This is some kind of blackmail. No. Oh, well. I'll admit, you've got me interested. Go ahead. Well, I was left with less than $500. And you can't live long on that amount in New York. Of course, I tried to locate Richard Appleton. But the police told me there was no such person in Equity or the League of New York Theaters or in the Bucks County telephone book. I don't suppose Appleton was his real name anyway. He was gone with my money, and I didn't think I'd ever see him again. Then, just this morning, I went into a cafeteria on 23rd Street, and there he was, sitting alone at a table, having breakfast. He didn't see me until I'd taken a seat opposite him. Excuse me, here, let me get that tray out of your way, miss. Oh. Oh. How do you do, Dick? I beg your pardon? I'd like my money back. I'm afraid there must be some mistake. We can start with the fact that you called me, uh... Dick, wasn't it? Actually, my name is, uh, Mortimer. Mm-hmm. I don't imagine your name is Mortimer any more than it is Dick, and I don't care what your name is. I want my money. Say, miss, are you quite sure you're all right? Perhaps I should call a doctor, or... Uh, perhaps I should call a policeman. Really, I don't know what this is all about, but by all means, let's untangle it, shall we? If you're looking for a policeman, there's one over there. Oh, where? Right behind you. Oh, well, then, I... tricked me. There wasn't any policeman there. He was just getting me to turn around. And now, there he was, running away from me, and I was screaming at the top of my lungs. But you know what New York is like. As soon as I screamed, stop, thief, everybody in that cafeteria hunched over their coffee and pretended not to hear me. So I had to chase Dick Appleton myself. Well, he knew I was after him. He ran down the street, turned the corner, but he never got very far ahead of me. I didn't waste my breath. I knew no one would help me. But he turned another corner, and when I reached it, I was just in time to see him running up the steps of a brownstone house. And I pounded up the stairs after him. The nameplates on the doorbell revealed only one with the initials R.A., Roger, Amster, and 2B. I took a chance, and I went to 2B. I uh, think I'm in better condition than you are, Mr. Appleton. Hamster, hamster, or whatever it is. I, If you want to start running again, I, I can chase you all over town. But sooner or later, you'll have to give me my money. Well, I guess the jig is up, eh? Why don't you come in? No, thank you. Look, if the money is in this room, please go get it and bring it here to the door. If you have to go out to the bank for it, I shall go with you. 
And if I've spent it... If you've spent it, you'll go with me to the police. Look, Betty, you may be able to outrun me. But really, I am taller and stronger than you are. Ow! Now, what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to walk right past you and out of here. I think not. Now, listen, you let me go. To the police. Do I look like an idiot? I- I'm leaving. Are you real? Oh, yes, I... Oh, you... You wouldn't. Rather a pretty little knife, isn't it? Oh, no. no. Very sharp, too. Quite valuable. Not merely because it has a jeweled handle. Oh, you wouldn't dare use that knife. I'm afraid that's only your opinion. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting out of here. Oh, no. No, no. Stop it. No. Stop it. Oh. oh, my God. Are you trying to tell me you killed him? Yes, Mr. Darren. When was this? I told you. This morning. This morning? Wait a minute. How do you know he's dead? Well, I, I, uh, I, I didn't leave right away. I, uh, examined him. You want me to go into detail? No. Look, if he'd been alive, I would have called an ambulance. What have you been doing since this morning? I've been, I've been walking around the city trying to think what I should do. And anyway, around two o'clock this afternoon, I, I called the police... And I told them a man had been murdered and where they could find the body. You didn't tell them who you were? No, not then, but but I'm going to. Uh, when I leave here, I'm, I'm going right to the police station. I've never heard of anything like this. I'm sure you haven't. But why did you come here? What have I got to do with you or, or with that Appleton or whatever his name is? I told you I had a favor to ask of you. You told me more than that. You said you were going to ask for money and that I'd give it to you. Well, I won't. Won't? Not even when it means hundreds of thousands of dollars in your pocket for a relatively small investment? What are you talking about? Mr. Darren, you've been looking for a melodrama. And I need money for my defense. Now, haven't I given you a good plot for a melodrama? And isn't that worth the money to you that my lawyer will ask? Uh, Well, well, you're going too fast for me. Look, I don't claim I've told you the whole play. But what happened today brings us up to a good first act ending. Mr. Darren, at the end of the first act, the girl comes to the producer and asks for money, just as I've asked money from you, for the defense. Hmm. It's not a bad first act. All right. Now, suppose the producer helped her. Suppose you shielded me, hid me, while the police were looking for me, while you were looking for proof that I did it in self-defense. I think you've got something. Listen. There's a playwright I know, and if I can get him on the phone, he'll be over here in half an hour, and you tell him everything you uh, told that, me. That uh, won't be necessary, Mr. Darren. Huh? Mr. Darren, you have been trying to get every big playwright in town to write you a melodrama, is that right? Yeah. But you ought to know that nowadays, big-name playwrights are interested only in one thing, in those plays about girls who suck their thumbs or sit in sandboxes. Mr. Darren, would you please tell me why you never read your unsolicited manuscripts from unknown playwrights? What are you talking about? Uh, just a minute. Is that your pile of unsolicited scripts? Excuse me a minute. All right, now let's see. Ah, here it is. Now, here is a play you've had in your office for exactly four months, Mr. Darren. You've apparently never read it, but you know something? Just now, you found the first act awfully interesting. Melodrama, play in three acts. By Mary Biddle, that's me. It'll make you a million dollars, Mr. Darren. It'll make you a genius. Melodrama, written by Robert Sanadella and directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Rosemary Rice, George Petrie, and Lon Clark. Audio engineer, Bill Sandreuter. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Story editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite and will appreciate your comments. 
please write to Theater 5, New York, 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. Strange creatures, gruesome murders, oozing organisms, unfathomable abductions, enigmatic expeditions, an age-old malevolence, and much more. Author J.C. Moore delivers a collection of dark horror tales that are both chilling and poignant. Dark Intrigues Book 1 is filled with horror fiction for fans of short story anthologies, horror collections, ghost fiction, suspense, possession, and more. Dark Intrigues Book 1 by J.C. Moore, available on Kindle or as an audiobook narrated by Darren Marlar. Find Dark Intrigues Book 1 on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. created by the pen. Comparatively few are destined for a long public life. However, Dashiell Hammett, the mystery writer, created a couple of characters named Nick and Nora Charles about ten or more years ago. Well, Nora and Nick are still around and still doing fine, as you hear tonight in the Mystery Playhouse. Tonight, the Mystery Playhouse is host to Nick and Nora Charles. They appear in another episode from The Adventures of the Thin Man. Well, to begin with, our mystery in the lighter vein is chock full of surprising and unusual occurrences. Take, for instance, the fact that it's 9 o'clock in the morning when our story opens, and Nick Charles, who usually can't be pried from the arms of Morpheus before noon except in case of fire or disorder is not only up, but fully dressed. And it's in this extremely unlikely situation that he's found by his good friend Ebenezer Williams, sheriff of Crabtree County. Eb is very surprised indeed. In fact, you might say he's amazed. Well, all dressed. My Godfrey. You sure you're all right, Nick? Oh, come in, Eb. I've been going crazy. I've been up all night. What's wrong? Dora's gone. She left the house yesterday afternoon. I haven't heard a word from her since. So she finally come to her senses. Did she find another fella? Yeah, this is serious. I, I called the police, the newspapers. There's not a trace of her. This never happened before. Oh, take it easy, Nick. Yeah, but I've never felt so miserable. Well, look at me. No no dinner, no sleep, no Nora. Uh, maybe that'll learn you to be nice to your next wife. I don't want a next wife. I want the one I got. You, you can't get that model anymore. What am I saying? Eb, Eb, do, you, do you really think she left me? Maybe. Oh, Oh, maybe that's the police. Maybe they found the body. Maybe. Shall I answer it? No, I'll face it. I have it coming to me. Hello? Hello. Tell Nora that Wolfie is calling. Who are you? Wolfie, you dope. Well, I'm Nora's husband. Don't worry. You won't be for long. Oh, how do you know? Because I'm the guy she's going to marry. Who says so? She does. She proposed to me last night. Hey, what is this, a gag? What... What did you do to my wife? My dear fellow... Hey, come on, you punk talk. I refuse to listen to such language over a telephone. Oh. Hello? Hello? Who was that? Some idiot Nora promised to marry last night. That ain't possible. She can't be married to two idiots at the same time. The guy screamed just before he hung up. Eb, what could have happened to Nora? Uh, hello? Hello? This is Leo. Hello, Leo. What do you want? Two hundred dollars, of course. What for? The mirror, naturally. It's cheap. 
Well, that's Leo for you. Always a sucker for a beautiful dame. Listen, I don't know anything about this. Well, didn't your wife tell you about me? No. Oh, that's deceptive. Where'd you last see my wife? In Leo's. The gathering place of convivial spirits. She left after she broke the mirror behind my bar. Why? My wife didn't get home. I've been looking everywhere for her. Entre nous, bud. You shouldn't let a dame like that go around loose. That's just it. Was she loose? Well, I'd say she was tight. That's impossible. Nora never gets tight. Does she throw horseshoes at mirrors in her natural state? Where did she get a horseshoe? From a horse, naturally. Who was my wife with? One was a female lady of interesting design. The other was a male gentleman of designing interest. What are you talking about? The guy I know. His name is Bill Martin, and no good. The dame I didn't know. Listen, I'll, I'll be down to your place. Where, where is it? On 6th Avenue in the village. You know what I'd do if I had a wife like yours, bud? Oh, what? I'd lock her and me in a golden cage and throw away the key. Bye. Goodbye, Leo. Oh, Ed, this is the zaniest thing that ever happened. Thank you, darling. No. Oh, and every you. How are you, Ed? Hi, Nori. How are you? Oh. Or is it a military secret? Uh, I'm feeling deliriously hilarious. Have you ever walked on bubbles? No, dear. It requires the greatest delicacy, and it's hard to keep your balance. Here's me, darling. Nora, what have you been drinking? I didn't touch the drop. All I had was one teeny wee cup of tea. Tea? Mm-hmm. Covered, Where were you last night? Kiss me first. There. Now, mm. where were you last night? Oh, uh, last night? Well, darling, I had tea with Joan Lawrence, and then... Then I don't remember. Well, that's odd, isn't it? Well, don't you remember anything? Of course. I woke up in a nice, comfy hotel suite. And I tried to phone you, but the line was busy, so I came over and here I am. Uh, with William nailed down that floor. Oh, get me! Laura, she's, she's out here. Yeah. Well, I reckon that solves the mystery of your mission wife. No, Eb, you're wrong. I'm afraid we're at the beginning of another mystery. Huh? Look up Dr. Barton's name in the phone book. Tell him to get up here immediately. Why? Is there something wrong? Look at her eyes, Eb. Unless I'm crazy, she's been drugged. Am I dying? No, dear. The doctor said you'll be okay. The doctor? Yes, Sonori. You've been drugged. Oh, why should anyone want to do a thing like that to little me? Mm, that's what I want to find out. What happened after you had tea with Joan Lawrence? I, I don't know. In your bag, we found a key to a suite in the Wilson Hotel. You remember registering there? No, but I woke up there. Where'd you go between the time you had tea with Joan and the time you woke up? I have no idea. Do you remember going to a joint called Leo's? The gathering place of convivial spirits? Hmm, sounds delightful. Was I there? I reckon so. You broke the mirror behind his bar with a horseshoe. Now, what made you do a thing like that? Well, I can't imagine it. But I do remember one thing. There was the nicest man with me and Joan. Wolfie? No. No, I don't remember anyone named Wolfie. Well, you should, dear. You asked him to marry you. You know, I must have had a wonderful time. Tell me more. You know a fellow named Bill Martin? That's him. He's the nicest man. Joan knew him. He's in business with her husband. Darling, did you call Joan? Yes, baby. No one answers at her apartment. Well, that's funny. Nick, do you think something happened to Joan? I don't know, darling. But I don't think you were drugged by accident. We're going to the Wilson Hotel and check that key you have. <laughs> Is this the suite you woke up in? Mm-hmm. I remember. It looked a mess. Looks like a hurricane struck it. 
Isn't it a shame, dear? What? I evidently had the time of my life last night, and I didn't even know it. Hey, uh, Mr. Russell left his bag here. Ed, will you help me open it? Okay, baby, dokey. Hey, that's sure an oversized suitcase. Looks more like a little trunk. Now she's open it. Nick! Don't be frightened, baby. He can't hurt you. He's dead. That, that's Bill Martin. He was the nicest man. The one that told you about it. We... The woman's compact in his pocket. That's my compact. wonder how he got it. Nora, did you kill him? Me? Kill him? Yes. Darling, now, 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 don't be afraid to tell me the truth. Well, I, I don't remember. Now, so try to think. Did you stick a knife in his back because, because he got fresh? Well, I, I don't know. You sure he was killed with a knife, Nick? Well, yeah, you can see the wound in his back. Say, there's blood stains here near the telephone. Did you find anything more on his body? Just this watch. Oh, you can't use that, Nick. It's broken. Give it back. Just a second. Nick, could that be broke like that because a bullet hit it? What I was wondering, Ed. The hand stopped at 5.30. No bullet holes in this guy. Nora, you keep this watch. Uh, what's the name of the restaurant where you had tea with Joan Lawrence? The Bixley on Lower Fifth Avenue. It's near Joan's Park. I'm going down there. Do you think poor Joan is dead, too? Maybe, baby. I want you and Ed to take a careful look around here and then go to Joan's apartment. Ed, use this collection of skeleton keys to get in. So long, darling. Take good care of her, Ab. All right. Ab. Hmm? You don't think I killed him, do you? I don't know, Nori. Say, will you take a look in them closets? I'm going over that other room. Yeah. All right, Ab. Oh, what a lovely... Oh, my neck! Let go! Let go! Find anything in that closet, Nori? Nori! Don't you hear me? Nori, I just look... Look! Nori! on duty in this restaurant about five o'clock yesterday afternoon. Yeah. Hey, ain't you Nick Charles? That's right. Don't you remember me? Raphael, the rat. Of course, I sent you up, didn't I? Yeah. I could have got 50 years, but you only let me get 10. Gee, you changed. You used to be a good-looking young fella. Well, I hope you've changed too, Raphael. Here, uh, will you take a look at this picture in my wallet? I'm tall. That's my wife. Did you serve her yesterday? What does the rest of her look like? Usual accessories, but well played. She was here. What another dame. This other dame had a wonderful bill. I saved them. Where? In that boot right over there. Now listen, Raphael. I want you to remember exactly what happened while they were here. Try and recall every detail. If it will help your memory, act it out. Okay. Now, uh, let me see. You be your wife. I am the girl with the bill. So, we come in. We look around to see if anybody notices what terrific lookers we is. And after we see that all the wolves is foaming at the mouth, we sit down. Now, where, where do I sit? In the corner of the booth. Me. I'm the other girl. I sit here. So another person joins us. A guy named Bill. Very good looking. Bill Martin? Yeah, yeah, that's his name. He ordered cocktail. Now listen carefully. Did you see Bill Martin put anything in the girls' tea? No. But an hour later, they was all still here. Bill had lots of drinks. And they was all laughing like things was hilarious. Did you see any of them leave? Yeah. I left. I mean me. The, uh, the girl with the pill. I comes up and asks me, Rayfield... Where is the telephone booth? And I tell me. And me, Rayfield, I see your wife and a man in the booth. How'd my wife look? Tired like. Sort of sitting in the corner, leaning back with her eyes closed. 
I figure she drunk some of the guy's cocktails. When did this girl return? In about five minutes. Did the man leave the booth at all? No. Why should he leave when he's got a good-looking babe like your wife there? About six o'clock, they all left together. They all walked with a wobble. Okay, Rachel. I guess that'll be all. Thanks. Don't mention it. And if you need my help again, be free to call on me. Nothing's too much for the guy what set me up the river for ten years. Of course I will accept your check for $200, Mr. Charles. That's Leo for you. You'll take a check from anybody. You mind if I ask you a few questions, Leo? Not at all. I personally am a convivial spirit. And I like conversation. At what time did my wife break that mirror? At precisely 2 a.m. What makes you so sure? I was waiting here to warn us. You know, they have it on the radio every hour. Bill Martin and this girl were with my wife all the time? Yeah. Why did you say Bill Martin was a no-good? Did you ever hear of Pedro Gonzalez? Sure, he used to have a bootlegging mark. It's black market now. This guy, Bill Martin, was connected with him. He tried to sell me some tax-free liquor once. Hmm. Leo, can, can I use your phone? Sure, sure, go ahead. Take a tip from me, pal. Don't fool around with Gonzales. He ain't no convivial spirit. Well, I'm just trying to find out if Martin drugged my wife. Hello? Uh, hello, Eb. How long have you been there at Jones' place? Oh, a few minutes, Nick. Say, I'm glad you called. The killer was hiding in one of the closets. Did, did you get him? No, the killer got us. What? He shot Nori on the head. But she's all right now. Oh, good. He sneaked out the side entrance. Did, did you find anything important in the apartment? I reckon so. We found another corpse. Who? Joan? No, no. The husband. Shot full of bullet holes. And plenty murdered. Yeah. All right, I bet you, Nick. All right, Nick, I'll do like you say. All right. Did Nick find the killer, Ab? No. But he was telling me about the information he dug up. What are you doing there, Ed? Just looking at this corpse's pocket, Nori. There's a bullet hole into it. I didn't notice that before. Is it important? Maybe. Now, that's the vest pocket where a fellow usually carries a watch. You know, I think this fellow was not only killed, he was robbed by Godfrey. Ed, did you notice that banjo clock on the wall? Well... What about it? It stopped at two. And the reason it stopped is because there are a couple of bullet holes in it. Look. Oh, Joan, darling. Hello, Nora. Oh, I've got the most awful headache. I... Duke! Yeah, but what happened Now, don't. To him? Don't try to put yourself together. Your husband's been murdered. We found him here like that. Now, dear. Oh, no, this is awful. There, now. Nick and our friend Ed Williams are working on this case. Now, if you can keep a grip on yourself, you can help us. I'll be all right, Nora. I was afraid something like this was going to happen. That's why I wanted to talk to you yesterday. My husband and Bill Martin, they were in trouble with Pedro Gonzalez. He's a gangster, you know. Yeah, Nick told me all about that. Miss Lawrence, uh, where was you last night? Well, I, I, I'm not really sure. It's all very hazy. I, I woke up only a few minutes ago at the Royal Crest Hotel. Did anything happen to Bill Martin? He's been murdered, too. Oh, no. Nora, he was drugged. Well, then... Then I must have been drugged, too. Well, of course, I see it all now. They drugged us so I, I wouldn't go home and find them killing Gilbert. And Bill Martin must have known about it. He was very close to them, so they killed him to keep him quiet. Yeah. Was your husband alive at two yesterday afternoon? Well, yes, I... I had lunch with him. Joan, why'd you murder your husband? What are you talking about? You, Joan. You murdered both of them. No, he, he's crazy, isn't he? Eb, how could she have done it? It's impossible. No, she drugged you at about 5.15 yesterday afternoon, then left, saying she had to make a phone call. But instead, she come up here and killed her husband. She turned the clock back to two, put a few bullets into it, come back to the restaurant where you were sitting with Bill Martin. 
In your condition, Nora, you didn't even know she'd been gone. I don't remember everything, but I do know Joan was with me last night. Sure. She was using you as an alibi. At 2 a.m., the time she wanted the police to believe the murder was committed, she and Bill Martin put you up to throwing that horseshoe into the mirror in back of Leo's bar. But why'd she want me to do a thing like that, Ian? To strengthen the alibi. Ain't that right, Joan? He's out of his head. Am I? You give Nori an extra dose of the drug. Put her to bed at the Wilson Hotel. Now, up to this point, Bill Martin was helping you. Your problem now was to get rid of Martin. I suppose I killed him, too. You told him to call Nick's place, act like a goon, and use the name Wolfie. The object was to see if Nori was home yet. Well, since he finished phoning, you drove a knife into his back. Nick even heard his scream. Listen, if I'm such a clever killer, why'd they ever pick on Nora to have tea with me? Because you knew after your husband was found dead that Nori would get Nick interested in the case. It'd be simple to hint that Bill Martin got some hoodlum to do it. Martin would appear especially guilty since he was dead also. All right. Get him up, both of you. I'm getting out of here. If any of you try to follow me, you'll be killed. Goodbye. Hello. <laughs> Ricky. Oh, I just clipped her lightly on the chin, darling. Well, guess what? Eb solved the whole thing. She's the killer. Well, of course, baby. I knew it all along. Now, how did you figure it out? Darling, you know I never discuss such things outside our bedroom. Wait till tonight. Why can't you ever tell me how brilliant you are in broad daylight? <laughs> All right, dear, I'm ready and waiting for your story. Well, it was simplicity itself, baby. I knew that whoever drugged you probably committed the murder. There were only two suspects, Martin and Joan. And since Martin was dead, it had to be Joan. Right. I was afraid for a while that Joan was dead, too. I'd have to investigate Gonzalez. Joan confessed that she did it for her husband's insurance. Martin was in love with her, and so was a willing accomplice. Did you miss me last night, dear? Well, not at all. You big liar. Eb, tell me what you said. I ought to stay away more often. It'll make you appreciate me. Better not try it, or, or I'll stay away nights, too. What about me did you miss most of all, Mickey? The way you say good night. Oh. Well, then. Good night, Mickey, darling. <laughs> Nick and Nora Charles for another chapter in the adventures of the Thin Man. Tonight's presentation in the Mystery Playhouse. Before taking our usual trip to the green room, let's discuss three ways we can all help lengthen the war. Here they are. First, throw away all your extra equipment. Second, don't take care of the equipment and ordnance you have left. Third, Waste your field rations. Only eat the parts you like. Well, that's only three ways. But if each and every man and woman in the service indulged in just those three consistently, V-Day would be a far cry indeed. Of course, no, one's, no one would act like that on purpose, but unfortunately, we all tend to treat GI materiel a little bit like a stepsister. And when you multiply your callousness and wastage a million or more times, it's no longer funny. So let's not help lengthen the war. Let's shorten it by conserving everything we have. This is Sergeant X, closing the doors of the Mystery Playhouse. Good night. Sleep tight. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called 
Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Now, The Rattlesnake and the Barefoot Bride, dramatized from True Detective Mysteries magazine. Our story begins on the night of August 5th, 1935, outside of Los Angeles, California, in the peaceful little community of La Cañada. Summer night is scented with the haunting fragrance of orange blossoms, whose drifting petals somehow seem like falling tears. And that strange sound that seems to float on the air, like the echo of some weird rattle. What is that? We shall see. Hey, Bob, maybe Mary's asleep. Just too bad if she is. We'll wake her up. Oh, Bob, don't do that. Don't you think Harry and I could come and visit some other time? Nothing doing. Well, did I ask you and Harry to come over tonight because, well, Mary hasn't been feeling well lately, and I thought you could cheer her up. We'll try. I'm so sorry. Yes, Mary looked grand when I last saw her. Always does. She's so beautiful with that lovely blonde hair and perfect white skin. Yeah. Having a 27th birthday party soon. She'll have to come out. Here, up the driveway. Come on. Come right in. I'll turn on the light. Why, Father. Oh, how lovely. So this is where you keep your bride. Not bad for a barber, huh? Beautiful home, beautiful wife. Yeah, I'll call it. Mary. Oh, Mary. We got company. Down here? Funny. Maybe she's upstairs. I'll run up and see. Mary! Another judge in the house over here. Mary! Harry, I, I hope nothing's the matter. Oh, don't be silly. What could be the matter? Mary! This house seems so, so empty. Oh, Mary's probably out in the backyard feeding those rabbits of hers Bob was telling us about. Maybe she's visiting neighbors. Neighbors? Not a chance. She doesn't know any of them. Hey, where are those flashlights? Flashlights? Yeah, here, Harry. You take this flashlight and I'll take this one. Well, it's just outside the house. Uh, sir? Bob, yeah. Bob, do you really think... Please, let's hurry. Mary has been, hasn't been well lately. I'm afraid she may have had a busy spell and fallen down somewhere. I'm glad now we decided to stay. Yeah. Harry, you take that flashlight and look out in the front yard. I'll look around outside. All right. Uh, come on, Mildred. Outside, quick. Here. I'll, I'll hold the flashlight. Do you see anything? No. Oh, only those orange blossoms. Anything but those flower beds? No. Oh, Harry! Get anything out of the front yard? No, Bob, nothing here. I'm looking for all the rabbits, man. Oh, Harry! Yes? Take a look at the side yard, will you? All right. Come on, Mildred. It sure is dark out here. Certainly needed this flashlight. Uh, what's this? Well, it's a little fish pond with a fountain. A lily pond. Oh, look, it has water lilies in it. They're nice blooming. In full bloom, too. See how they Harry, have... what's that? What? There. There, on the other side of the pool. Hold your flashlight. 
Mary! Merciful heaven. Bob! Bob! Mary! Oh, Mary! Oh, look! Look at the hair around that water lily. Oh! Oh, Lord! Mary! How did this happen? Oh, my poor little girl. Steady, Bob. Mary! <laughs> I think I'd better call the police. Happened, James? Uh, I don't know, Sheriff. He's not himself <laughs> yet, Sheriff. Uh, maybe I can help you. Do you know what happened? Well, not exactly, Sheriff, but Bob here told us that Mary, his wife, was subject to dizzy spells. Well, I figure she fainted and fell into the pond. Uh-huh. Then... Yes, I see. We're going out again to look things over. You two stay here with James. Yes, sir. Come on, Jonesy. All right. flashlight down on a leg. Oh, look at that. Oh, well, a leg is swollen nearly twice the size of the other one. Was she in an accident or something? I don't know. Here comes the doctor. We'll ask him what he thinks. Oh, Doc. Doc, here, this way, please. Oh, hello, Sheriff. Is this the patient? Yeah, too late for being a patient, I guess, Doc. Looks like a drowning. Hmm. Rather unusual in a shallow pool like this, isn't it? Yeah. Say, Doc, look at that left leg. What do you make of it? Hmm. Looks like a like a bite of some sort. Do you know what kind? Well, that's that's hard to say. It, it might be some insect, like well, like a black widow spider. But I I can't say for sure without a chemical analysis. You take charge of the body until the coroner comes, will you, Doctor? Yes, I will. Come on, Jonesy. Let's go inside again. All right. <laughs> You any better, James? <laughs> Still too upset, eh? Maybe you can help us, North. What do you want to know? Has Mrs. James been in an accident recently? Oh, I, I really don't know. I didn't hear about any accidents. Hey, what's this? Mind if I read this letter? Hmm. Look at this, Jonesy. Here's your answer. Yes, yes. Just a line to let you know I'm pretty sick. My leg is all swollen. Something bit me while watering in the garden. And having lots of bad luck. This is old Blue Monday, but my daddy will be home early tonight, and he takes good care of me. Mary. Sitting by something in the garden, eh? Well, that's it. Yep. You don't need us here now, do you, man? Uh, suppose I take James home with me tonight. Pretty well shot, and I think a good night's sleep somewhere else would do him good. That'll be okay, I guess. Well, come on, Bob, and Mildred. We're going out. There you. You sit in the back of the car, Bob, and you'll be more comfortable there. Feel any better, Bob? No. You know something, Harry? What? Too bad Mary had to die that way. What do you mean? Oh, it's going to look bad for me. For you? What are you driving at? My third wife found the bathtub in Colorado about three years ago. Well, what in the world has that got to do with me? Well, the cops will ask a lot of questions. And that's what's worrying you now? You sure are a queer duck. You are afraid of being questioned. And your wife's stone dead. Gee, you don't understand, Harry. Well, I guess I don't. <laughs> Join. Yes, sir. Here's how we found the body, Inspector. Face down in the pool, head and shoulders submerged, wore thin flowered silk dress, blue boudoir silk slippers, skirt pulled up over knees and legs bare. Oh, Mary loved to watch the goldfish play in the pond. There, Bob. <laughs> Come on now. Calm down. She must have fainted and fallen in the pond. Mr. James, the law of Los Angeles County has no wish to meddle with a husband's <laughs> grief. We simply want the facts. Yes, sir. Sheriff Stewart. Are all 
any witnesses present? Yes, Inspector. All right. Go ahead, Sheriff. We found this note, Inspector, on the table in the kitchen of the deceased's home. Let me have it. Uh, Mr. James, is this your wife's handwriting? Yes, sir. Uh, this letter is addressed to Mrs. R. H. Stewart, Las Vegas, Nevada. Do you know her? Yes, sir. Mrs. Stewart is her sister. Something bit her while watering in the garden. That would account for the swollen leg. Hmm. Today is Old Blue Monday. My daddy will be home early tonight. Uh, Mr. James, you were at the barber shop all day yesterday? Yes, sir. How long have you been married to the deceased? Three months. And say, Inspector, I've been married five times altogether. Quite a record for a man only 39, huh? Mr. James, we're not interested at this time in how many wives you've had. We're investigating the circumstances of this death. Sure, I, I thought I'd tell you about the other marriages so you wouldn't think I was holding out on you. I see. I'll say this. Mary was the best of the lot. She was a fine girl. Mr. James, did your wife carry any insurance? Yes. In a way, I'm sorry she did. That kind of puts me on the spot. You see, I'm the beneficiary. We're not accusing you of anything. How much insurance did your wife carry? She had two $5,000 policies that carried double indemnity clauses in case of accidental death. Mm, insurance, all right. Oh, uh, Dr. Long. Uh, yes, Inspector. Uh, Dr. Long, are you the James family physician? I was called in to treat Mrs. James about seven weeks ago. Go on, Doctor. Mrs. James was an expectant mother. Was Mrs. James subject to fainting spells? She was quite nervous. I prescribed a mild sedative. Would you say that in view of the state of her health, she might have fainted and fallen into the pool? Well, yes, it, it could have happened. Poor woman. Mother, mother. Don't cry, Bob. Please don't cry. Mary James was laid to rest in Los Angeles near the third wife of Robert James. The two brides of a strange barber lay side by side in eternal sleep. But the tragic story of Mary was not yet to have its final heart-rending chapter written. For while Robert James once more applied his shears in his barber shop in the office of Buren Fitz, district attorney of Los Angeles County, the shears of fate were also sniffing. Oh, uh, Tui, let's hear that coroner's report again. Yes, Mr. Fitz. Coroner's surgeon's report, Mrs. Mary Bush James came to her death on the night of August the 5th, 1935, as a result of drowning, with acute cellulitis of left foot and left leg following laceration of great left toe at contributing factor. Verdict, accidental drowning, case automatically closed. All right, Tui. Well... What else have you to suggest, Inspector Sutter? Uh, Mr. Fitz, there's about only one thing left to do. What's that? I've been doing some scouting around. This fellow James is taking a house out on LaSalle Avenue. Oh, who's his next-door neighbor? The house next door is vacant. Now, my idea would be to install a microphone in his house. Rent the house next door and listen in for a while. Hmm, that's a good idea. Oh, Sergeant, get me Chief of Police Davis on the phone. I want the best sound man in the department. <laughs> Microphone working now? Yes, sir. One in the bedroom and one in the living room. Okay, here comes a voice, Fester. Don't expect. Turn it on. Oh, 
Girl, a man of yours in Jean's barbershop? All oh, right, Captain. I thought I heard her voice sound familiar. She testified for him at the coroner's inquest, remember? Yeah. But where does this guy hope for in the pictures? He has something on Jane. He owns a green Jewett. That's all we know, but that's plenty. Come on, let's go. Right. <laughs> without parallel in the police history of Los Angeles was on. Armed with a complete list of all cars registered in the name of Hope, the law, grim and quiet, checked them one by one. On the morning of May 2nd, Inspector Studdard and Tui, acting on a tip, drove up to a lunchroom in Hermosa Beach, where Charlie Hope was employed and placed him under arrest for the murder of Mary James. While he was being drilled at headquarters, the two officers resumed their vigil at the recording instrument in the house next door to the one occupied by Bob James. James is a letter than usual tonight. I wonder if he knows that Hope was picked up today. No, the DA's office has him undercover. But Hope didn't track yet, Captain. Don't worry, Toa. With the Williams billing him, it won't be long now. We take James tonight, eh? You heard the chief's orders. We've got to get him red-handed. Listen. Here they come now. Charles Hope, I hand you the signed paper. Can you identify it? Yes, sir, I can. Tell the court what it is. My confession. You admit you wrote it? Yes, sir, I do. And you signed it? I did. Of your own free will? Yes, sir. You weren't forced to sign it? No, sir. Will you please read it to the jury? I, Charles H. Hope... For the purpose of... Oh, just a minute, just a minute. You may start with the next target, please. Yes, sir. About a year ago, I was broke. Went to Robert James' barber shop in Los Angeles to see if I could get a free haircut and shave. Oh, now, listen, Bob. Give me a free ride in the barber chair. Maybe I can help you someday. Nobody helps Bob James. Sure. Maybe you're the man I'm looking for. Like to make a hundred dollars? Boy, I jump at that chance. Uh-huh. How do I earn this hundred bucks? Yes, huh? A friend of mine says he'll pay a hundred dollars for some good live rattlesnakes. Huh? Rattlesnakes? Yeah, rattlesnakes. Not afraid of mine. But so that money, I ain't afraid of that. Huh? Here's the money. Give me two of the kind of snakes I want and keep the rest of the bill. Come on, I'll take my car. Come on. Are you 
Snake Joe? Yeah, Snake Joe, that's me. Got any good diamondback rattlesnake? Yeah, I got the meanest diamondbacks around here. Now, look here, mister. That they got a lot of venom in them? Venom? See, that's what Snake Joe's known for. They have what you call hot snakes, full of venom. You hear them rattling down in the pit? Yeah, I hear them. How about them two big rattlesnakes over there in the corner of the pit? How much would they be? Mm, I'll sell them rattles to you for 70 cents a pound. Oh, you sell them by the pound, eh? I'm sure that's the only way to sell rattlesnakes. Okay. I'll take them two big ones. Huh? Well, there's my stick in the nose here. Oh, here they are. Come on, lightning. Come on, there, four sons. Oh, I tell you, four of them two diamond bags is the meanest killers in the state of California. And they're wicked. Yeah, I brought this box with a glass top. Put them in here. Hey, both comes meaner than lightning. <laughs> yeah, they're plenty hot. Now, let's see. Take off the bait of the box. That's ten and a half pounds of hydro snake. That's $7.35. Change out of ten. Right here you are. I'll come again sometime. Okay. I got the snakes, Bob. Fine. You should back there with them. Are they hot ones? Yeah, and half. Diamondbacks and plenty hot. There's no third party in this. I want to collect some insurance. You're the only one in it with me. I don't get you. Huh? You'll soon find out. My wife, she's the one. I don't want to be mixed up in this kind of business. You'd like to get some real dough, wouldn't you? Excuse me? I thought so. Well, dear, please call the doctor. You won't need a doctor when I'm through with you. Bob, what do you mean? Please, Bob, don't you understand? I don't feel very well. Yeah. I'm so sorry, Mary. Come here. Come on. Right. What do you want, Bob? Uh, here. Take this pen and write what I tell her. Well, what do you want me to write? Bob, dear, what's come over you? You look so strange. Never mind. Just write. Thank you. Write this. Dear sis. Just a line to let you know I'm pretty sick. Pretty sick? Yeah. My leg is all swollen. But Bob, what do you mean? My leg isn't swollen. I said right. My leg is all swollen. Something bit me while watering in the garden. Yeah. I'm uh, having lots of bad luck. This is old Blue Monday, but uh, but my daddy will be home early tonight, and he takes good care of me. Uh, find it, Mary. Now put your darling sister's name and address on this envelope. All right. Bob, why did you make me write this to Sis? Turn around and don't talk so much. What are you doing with that adhesive tape, Bob? Bob, I'm frightened. Shut up. Bob, Shut what are you up. trying to do to me? Oh, my nose. 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 Oh, my Take it off, I tell you. Take it off. It's barefooted. It's barefooted. Oh, don't put a foot in there. Stop. It's natural. Real life of space. I'll open it up. I'll turn up the more. She's fainted. Now, I can take their snakes back and give them to Snake Joe. <laughs> I couldn't stand it in there. 
Is she dead yet? Yes, she's dead yet. She's been dead since four o'clock. To make double sure, I'd down in the bathtub. She's finished now, all right? Come in and help me carry her out. No, I can't. Come I can't on. Do them. Come on. You take her feet. I'll carry her head. We'll put her in a lily pond. Come on. And then, after that, he cleaned up the bathroom. And he drove me home. That's a lie! It's a lie! You did it! You did it! You did it! Robert S. James, jury having found you guilty of murder in the first degree, I hereby sentence you to be executed according to the law of the state of California at San Quentin Prison at the time prescribed. You are to be hanged by the neck until you are dead. The story you have just heard is The Rattlesnake and the Barefoot Bride, dramatized from True Detective Mysteries magazine and electrically transcribed for your pleasure by Transamerican. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. like a terrible nightmare. Even now, I sometimes wake from a dream and find myself shaking from the memory of it. I'll never forget when I first saw him. A man so monstrous, so unhuman, that I refuse to think it could ever happen again to anyone else. But who can be sure? Others have had the same idea. Oh, yes, the law forbids it, but laws are broken every day. Will it happen again to someone else? Someday, in the future, perhaps, perhaps it will happen to many. I don't want to see it. To hear the story of this strange monster, listen in a moment to 2000 Plus. Stories of science fiction from the years beyond 2000 A.D. Today, an amazing story of science uncontrolled. The giant walks. <laughs> Oh, yes, 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 Dr. Ellsworth. Is everything ready, Weston? 
Yes, Dr. Rutler. Fosco. Yes, sir. Then open the cage. Look at him, go. I've never seen a rat run a maze so rapidly. Check that gold gradient, Weston. Yes, Doctor. Uh-huh. The rat's in the food box now. Hey, let me see. 11.8. There. You see, Weston? Not an unusual intelligence. Just high. Well above that of the average rat. Look at them. The power in those legs. Barstow. <laughs> Just imagine what they could do with their teeth if they had the chance. It's frightening to think what would happen if all rats were giant rats. If they got loose. It's evolution, Barstow. Merely the scientific elimination of both barriers. Now that your experiment's a success, we can tell the world. Your theories will be accepted. You'll regain your rightful place in science. Not yet, Barstow. Not yet. I'm already at work on what I consider will be an ultimate experiment. It's only a matter of calculating, checking, and verifying data on the rats so we can build a larger pituitary revitalizer. Well, what animal do you have in mind for this new experiment, Dr. Osworth? What animal? Well, there's only one that I could possibly be interested in now. It's the next logical step. Surely you can't mean... Yes, Bosto. A man. Dr. Ellsworth? Yes, Weston. I want to talk to you about the experiment on human beings. I want you to help me with the experiment. But I... I hope you're not thinking of me, Dr. Ellsworth. I, I really don't What's think that I... What's the matter, Weston? Don't you think it would be valuable to give yourself to science? Well, it would seem that there are so many to choose from. So many, Weston? Who, for example? I'm sure that old Hawkins won't do... And we really can't kidnap them or anyone. But, Dr. Ellsworth, I, I, I was... I'd say it would be a great honor to be the first real Superman on Earth. Well, how about Barstow? Exactly, Weston. Just what I was leading up to. <sighs> you seem relieved. Yes. In Barstow, we have a real physical specimen. And he seems to have quite a boundless enthusiasm for the future of mankind. An attitude you apparently don't share. Well, how could we get him to agree to it? Psychology, Weston. It's merely a matter of appealing in the proper manner to his scientific judgment and sense of fair play. Now, here is what I want you to do when he gets back. <laughs> See you back, Barstow. Dr. Ellsworth, Weston tells me you're ready to begin the final experiments on man. Yes, Barstow, I soon hope to be the first of a new race. A race that will make the man of today look like a pygmy, puny, and insignificant. If the experiment succeeds, my physical size will double or even triple. I'll be able to live at least 300 years instead of the 100 or so odd years a man can expect today. The brain cells will probably also expand, giving me an intelligence... It will make you and Weston look like products of the Stone Age. Well, I don't think it's fair for you to sacrifice yourself. It's not fair to humanity. If you die, there'll be nobody to carry on. You know these experiments are illegal. We could never find another subject. It would have to be one of us three or nobody. Well, I'd be willing to take the chance, Dr. Ellsworth. And so would I. You can't go through with this, Dr. Ellsworth. You're needed to direct the experiment. Oh, gentlemen, gentlemen... I see you have the true scientific spirit. Well, since I am unwilling to give up my right to be the subject, and you're unwilling to let me be the subject, then there's only one way out. What's that? We'll draw lots. If you agree, leave the decision up to fate. That sounds like a good idea. Don't you think so, Barstow? Why, sure, I guess so. Well, it's the only way out, my boy. One of us must be the guinea pig. Now, I'll tear three strips of paper. Now, the lots are arranged in my hand. Whoever gets the short one will submit to the experiment, and there'll be no further objection from any of us. Agreed? Agreed. Right. Choose, gentlemen. Weston? 
Fosto. Myself. Hmm. I've drawn the short one. Yes. I'd like... I'd like some time to see Barbara, Dr. Ellsworth, before the experiment. I'll give you three weeks to straighten out your affairs, Barstow. Then I'll expect you back at the laboratory. Contacts are wide open. Cut the circuit, Weston. That's enough. Well, Barstow, are you ready? Quite ready, Dr. Ellsworth. As you know, it may be painful at first, but after the primary series, I don't think you'll notice much. I'm not worried, Dr. Ellsworth. No, of course not. Well, good luck, my boy. Thank you, sir. Contacts open, Weston? Yes, doctor. Then pipe the circuit. Now, that's fine. Now, keep it steady at 3,000. Prepare for the first injection. We'll give him five electronic unit charges. Valve open. He's out again. Dr. Ellsworth, you think we're doing the right thing? His heartbeat has slowed down so much, I'm afraid... Of what, Weston? You're not losing your nerve, are you? Oh, no, 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 it's uh, only that I thought... Don't do any thinking, Weston. I'll do that part of it. You just check the regenerator charts. Very well, Dr. Ellsworth. Nothing is going to keep me from completing this experiment. And I warn you not to try to interfere, Weston. I close the circuit. We'll inject again. 100 cc's. Valve open. Three weeks. I can't believe it, Dr. Rosworth. Look at him. Twelve feet tall, and he weighs 750 pounds. Of course, Weston. As I told you, there's very little difference, really, between a rat and a man. We're all animals. But, Doctor, he hasn't given much sign of life during the past few days. You think his body can stand the strain of all this growth? Certainly. In fact, I think we'll give him the final super injection today. About 500 cc should do it. 500? But that's five times what we've been giving him. Yes, Weston. We're building a new skeletal structure. New flesh, cartilage, and bones. Contacts open. Keep it steady at 6,000. We've got to provide the final shock for a system. The valve's completely open, Dr. Ellsworth. All right. Now. It's my creation. 
my creation. testing so far. Well, as best I can figure, Doctor, the subject can lift almost 20 times as much weight as an ordinary man and run approximately 60 miles an hour without difficulty. Oddly enough, though, he appears to get along fine on four or five hours sleep a night, but he's consuming food at a rate that's all out of proportion. Well, that's understandable. It's still making an adjustment. Go on. Mentally, very superior. He appears to be able to solve the most complicated problems right in his head. It's all just as I predicted. But this morning, though, after I just finished giving him the work test, he pulled up a tree by the roots and waved it at me. It was frightening. I ran and he began laughing. It sounded more like thunder. Well, then you're letting your imagination run away with you. It's quite obvious what's the matter. He's not getting enough exercise. We've got to give him more physical work to do. Come on. Sitting on that hill and staring. Boston! Yes, Dr. Ellsworth? I want you to take this special shovel we've made for you and dig a trench. Weston will mark it out for you and check your working speed. All right, Dr. Ellsworth. Whatever you say. See? It's quite simple. You've just got to keep him occupied. Dr. Ellsworth, I'd like to ask you a question. Yes? What are we going to do with Barstow? I mean, what are we going to tell the world about him? We can't go on continually this way. Yes, of course we can. And once we're sure of ourselves, we'll get other men. We'll make giants of them. We're building a race, Weston. A race of supermen with which we can rule the world. If only to learn how to control Barstow so he'll respond to our every command, then we'll build an army. Doctor, that's not right. You know, Weston, you're a good assistant. It's only when you think that you get into trouble. <laughs> for the next experiment. Oh, what's that to me? I don't think you understand. He's working on a method to control you electronically as a giant. It's what he's been waiting for. And when he can finally control you, he'll begin to make more giants. He wants to build an army of giants so he can take over the world. That isn't true. Dr. Ellsworth is interested only in science. You just don't want to be a freak as I am. Cut off from everything. Just because I was unlucky at drawing lots. No, no. Not unlucky, Barstow. Framed. Dr. Ellsworth and I agreed to volunteer just to get you to volunteer. We we, we arranged the lots so that you would be chosen. Uh -huh. I don't know anything. Oh, please, Barstow. That's why I let you know. I wanted you to do something about it before it's too late. So what are you going to do? Where are you going? Yes, Dr. Ellsworth, that's just what you'd like, isn't it? 
for me to calm down, to become nothing but a giant tool in your hands, a tool for conquest and revenge. Isn't that so, Dr. Ellsworth? I don't know what you're talking about. You know, all right. And what's more important, I know, Dr. Ellsworth. I know that you tricked me into volunteering for this experiment. What if I did? You were the best physical specimen. You'd stop at nothing to carry out your hideous experiments. Future of mankind. <laughs> That's a good one. You're not interested in mankind at all. You're only interested in building a super race for your own ends. You want an army of giants so you can take over the world. You're mad, Bosto. You are my subject and you have no right to behave this way. If I had the control of finishing... You... You knocked out that wall. Yes, Dr. Ellsworth. And that's just what I ought to do to you. You have no more right to live than I... How much strength does it take for a 30-foot man to kill an ordinary man with his fist, Dr. Ellsworth? Figure that out. What are you going to do? I'm not going to do anything to you. I'm going to let the World Science Council know about your experiments. They'll know what to do about you. But you can't leave. You're a monstrosity. The world won't understand you, Barstow. Besides, you have an obligation. You must sacrifice yourself for science. He's gone? Yes, all my plans ruined. Uh, yes, yes. Weston, you did this to me. You told him about my plans. Hey, yes, Dr. Ellsworth, I, I did. Oh, you've ruined the experiment, Weston. You betrayed science. You have no right to live. Who are you to decide these things? Come inside, Weston, now. A gun? Right. Come along now, Weston. There's one last experiment I want to perform. I'm curious to see how a man can stand up against a giant rat. No, no, please. Please, Ellsworth. I'll do anything you want. I don't want to die. I'll be the subject of a new experiment. It's too late, Weston. Shall not thought of those things before. Stand still. There. Right. By the cage. Oh, no. Now. Don't push me in. No. I'm not going to take your hands off of me. No. 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 the jet car tonight. Oh, it's a lovely night to go riding with you, Bob. Say, Helen, do you hear something? The motor, you mean? No, no, listen. I hear it now, too. I can't imagine it. Oh, well, I guess... Oh, Bob, over there! It, it looks like a man. But... So big! Oh, Bob! It's a giant standing in the road in front of us here. Turn the car around, quick! Oh, Bob! He's lifting us with his hands. Oh, Bob. Why are you afraid of me? I just want to talk to you. I won't hurt you. Put us down. Put us down, you monster. I'm not a monster. I am not. Oh, we're back on the road. He didn't hurt us. What are you going to do? I'm going to the police. They've got to know about this giant. <laughs> Seven. Well, I'll be. It's a man. But what a man. 
Rocket 117 to control tower. Located creature moving rapidly in the direction of McKenna City. We're closing in. Very good, 117. Keep on it. We'll have all available rocket cars join you. Okay, Tim, we're near enough now. Safety off destroyer guns. We'll fire a couple of warning shots to slow them down. Safety off. Fire. He's stopping. He's waving his hands. We'll circle him. Keep circling. Come in, 117. Come in. Circling time. Prepare to move in for a closer look. Guns ready. Orders. Repeat. Orders. Out, sir. He's swinging. Reverse entrance. Reverse entrance. Central control calling 117. Central control calling 117. They don't answer, Commissioner. Confound it. Why can't we get a video screen fix? I'm working on it, sir. Give me that microphone. All police jets and air rockets. All jets and air rockets. Attention. Attention. Rocket 117 has been attacked by the giant. Contact has been lost. Take battle formation blue. Prepare for attack. Prepare for attack. Good luck. We'll blast that creature out of existence. What could it be, sir? A man from another planet? It's possible. We can only get that video fix. Oh, I'm getting it, Commissioner. Look. There he is. Good heavens, what an enormous creature. Yes, I see it. Calling all rockets. Take elevation 3,000 and prepare to dive on target. I've got to see the police commissioner. You can't. It's a battle emergency. Who let you in the control room? It's about the giant. We've got to stop your attack. Are you crazy? That creature's a menace. He's knocked down one of our rockets, and now we're going to get him. But you don't understand, sir. Squadrons at all elevation 3,000. Targets in view. Look, commissioner, on the video screen. We're ready to open up on them, sir. Just give the order. No, no, no. You've got to call off the attack. Commissioner, look to the right of the giant near that small hill. Those two men are from Rocket 117. They're walking unmolested toward Junction 9. Thank God they're all right. Hey, you see, he's not dangerous. Stop the attack. That creature's been running berserk. Transmit the command for all ships to hold their positions until I give the order. Unless the giant attacks them. Yes, sir. Orders to all... Now, look here, sir. What do you know about that creature? Is he from another planet? It's an Earth man. How do you know? He escaped from a government antibiotics laboratory. He was a subject of an illegal experiment. I'm Dr. Weston. I, I, I work in that laboratory. Well, Earth man or not, he's a madman. We've got to do something about him. You don't have to do a thing. It'll all be over in a few minutes. Something's happened. I don't see the giant anymore. What do you mean, all over, Dr. Weston? Look at the video screen. There. That's what I mean. Good heavens. It's amazing. Squadron Leader 20 to Control Tower. Something's happened here, sir. I don't see the giant. He's disappeared. What are our orders? All police jets and rockets. Attack canceled. Repeat, attack canceled. So you see, Barbara, I had to thank Weston after all. He's a disagreeable character. But if he hadn't acted so promptly as soon as he found out, those rockets would have finished me. Oh, Ellsworth tried to kill Weston, didn't he, after you broke away? Yes, with the rats. Weston managed to get outside the cage, and they killed Dr. Ellsworth instead. And shortly after that, the rats fell into a coma, and Weston examined one by X-ray, and he discovered that the new bone structure was in the process of dissolving into cartilage, and that cartilage into flesh, which would soon melt away. And he realized their size had only been maintained by the injections. And it'd soon be back to their original skeletal structure. That's why he went to the police. Yes, but how did he know you'd shrink, too? Because they stopped giving me the injections. Oh, oh seeing you're here like this, I can't believe all those stories in the paper about you. It's a horrible picture. I can hardly believe it myself, Barbara. It's like a bad dream. Oh, yes. Here's what I came back for. Dr. Ellsworth's safe. Oh, what's in it? Here they are. And here they go. But you're burning them. Years of scientific research up in flames. Huh. But I don't want another man ever to go through what I did. To cut off from humanity. To be just a specimen in some scientist zoo. I found out one thing, Barbara. Thickness isn't a matter of size. A man can be 30 feet tall or he can be 6 feet tall. It's what he has in his heart that counts. This world doesn't need bigger, more powerful physical specimens. It needs men with bigness of soul. Who 
who can love, respect their fellow men. Next week, another exciting story on 2000 Plus. The strange adventure of a man who found nothing and was terrified. Be sure to listen next week to Alone. 2000 Plus is produced by Dreyer and Winolson Productions Incorporated. In today's cast, Joseph Julian was Barstow, Henry Norell was Eldworth, Lon Clark was Weston, Bryna Rayburn was Barbara, Morton Lawrence was the police commissioner, and Bruce Evans was Hawkins. The script was written by Julian Snyder. was composed by Elliot Jacoby, the orchestra conducted by Emerson Buckley, sound Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner, engineer Bob Albrecht, this is Ken Marvin speaking. came from New York. Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. From Hollywood, Miss Marjorie Reardon in... Unexpected. The unexpected. The unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected. Romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in the unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. Miss Marjorie Reardon, outstanding motion picture and stage star in Horoscope, a drama of the unexpected. I didn't mean to kill him. Not really. But I knew it was going to happen. The horoscope had told me. Yes, everything started with that fantastic horoscope. Life is written in the stars, madame. And there are no secrets if one is willing to read. 
Can you really tell the future, Mr. Iran? I'm only interested in that. I want to know what is going to happen. In the heavens, there is no future and no past. The stars know no time, no yesterday, no tomorrow. But I thought that you... Yes, you are expecting predictions, madame. But I do not predict. I can only reveal the journeys that our planets indicate. Part of these journeys has already passed. Part is ahead, and you must differentiate. Oh, I'm afraid I don't understand. It is quite simple. I will interpret several facts. You must determine if they have already happened or if they will occur. Oh, I see. Now, first, you are acquainted with a tall, red-haired man. He, uh, he will marry you or perhaps has already married you. Yes, that's my husband. Very well. Next, a friend, a woman of foreign birth, and a quarrel are indicated. A foreigner? That is correct. But I don't know any foreign women. Then she is yet to come. Oh? And someone of great importance to your life vanishes. Of great importance vanishes. Oh, I know. Roger's going to Duluth next Tuesday. Yes, that must be it. No, it is not your husband. A woman, small, dark, someone very close to you. <laughs> there never have been any important women in my life. Certainly none who disappeared suddenly. This woman will. Are you sure that it isn't a man? The stars are always sure. Very well. I is that all? Yes. Except for one thing. Well? There is death in your horoscope. Death? Someone dies, and you are responsible. Oh, I'm afraid The I stars don't... reveal that you are going to kill a man. I didn't believe a word of it. How could that little oily man in the dirty white turban sit there grinning, telling me that I was... that I was going to commit a murder? Oh, it was utterly ridiculous. Impossible. Mr. Aran, that's not true. You're, you're trying to frighten me. I don't know why, but you are. That can't be in my horoscope. It just can't be. The reading is completed, madame. But you can't the be... The stars do not lie, madame. Good afternoon. I was trembling as I walked through the dingy velvet curtains and out into the clean air of the, uh, of the street. But then, in the business of shopping, permanent waving, and matineeing, the horoscope slipped out of my mind. I didn't think about Mr. Arand again, or the little airless, incense-filled room, or the future he had foretold, until nearly a week later. It was my bridge afternoon. Martha Perkins and I had been partners, as usual, and the game had gone quite well. But as we got up to change tables... Martha turned to me, her eyes hard and glinting. Are you deliberately trying to lose the game, Edith? What are you talking about? If you don't know, it's time you found out. Bridge is usually played according to rules, and a two-bit is considered forcing. But I certainly gave a response. Oh, really, Edith? I think that your playing is getting very tiresome. An incorrect bid is worse than no bid at all. Well, I assure you I'll be glad to get another partner. That doesn't bother me a bit. As a matter of fact, I won't be able to play for a few weeks anyway. I'm going to Canada for the summer. How nice. Yes, isn't it? My mother and father live there. I'm going for a visit. Oh? I didn't know your parents were Canadian. I don't know what difference that makes. And if it's of any interest to you, I'm not an American citizen myself. Now will you try to concentrate on the cards just a little bit, Edith? If it's not asking too much. <laughs> I don't know why, but the quarrel with Martha upset me. I was surprised to learn that she was a Canadian. For some reason, it seemed important. And then I remembered the horoscope, the first prediction, a quarrel with a foreign woman. Perhaps there was something to Mr. Arand and his stars. After a moment, I shrugged. Oh, it was too absurd. Canada isn't a foreign country, not really. And Iran was such a fake, nothing but a cheap fortune teller. The argument with Martha had been a coincidence. Just a coincidence.
When I got home that night, Roger was waiting for me, sitting in the big chair in the living room. He was holding something in his hand and looked up sharply as I came into the room. Hello, dear. You're late. <gasps> Roger! What, whatever are you doing with a gun? Cleaning it. The man at the store said one should always clean a new revolver before using it. But what's it for? You? For me? Well, I thought since I'm going away for a few days, you might need it. There have been so many robberies in this district lately, and I don't like the idea of your being alone here at night. Roger, I won't be alone. I'm afraid you will, dear. You see, Sarah left this evening. Left? Yeah. She just walked out, said something about her mother needing her, and that was all the explanation I got. That doesn't seem possible. Uh, servants are all alike nowadays. But, but Sarah was like a part of the family. She's been with us always, for years. Well, what can you do about it? She's gone. Oh, it's so strange. Not a bit like her to leave without warning us. I don't know what I'll do without Sarah. I really don't know. Someone very close to you, of great importance in your life, vanishes. Oh, no, it isn't possible. It's another coincidence. What's the matter with you, Edith? What are you mumbling about? What? Why, nothing, nothing at all, Roger. I, I was just a little stunned by Sarah's leaving. Well, don't worry. You'll be all right. Now, here. I want to show you how to use this gun, just in case. No, Roger, I won't touch it. I won't. There's no reason to be afraid. If a person understands firearms, he's all right. People who don't know how to use them are the ones who always get hurt. Don't you understand, Roger? I won't touch that gun. Oh, now, don't be so childish, Edith. It can't bite you. I don't want to kill anyone, Roger. Don't make me kill anyone. Please don't make me kill anyone. What are you talking about? Oh, I can't explain it, but I have a sort of premonition. A feeling that I might... I might shoot somebody and kill them. What utter nonsense, Edith. Oh, yes, I know it is, but that's the way I feel. I can't help it. Oh, very well. In any case, I'll just put the revolver on the table next to your bed. You won't have to touch it unless you need to. But I don't want to. And I don't want to hear any more about it. For heaven's sake, Edith, you're acting like a child. Uh, forget that I ever mentioned the gun and stop being so silly. At last, I persuaded myself to go to bed. I thought it was terribly late, and I knew it was when I heard the clock strike. I think I was just dozing off when... Something awakened me. I sat up suddenly, listening. Oh, it was just a dog. I relaxed again. Oh, no. Someone was on the front porch. I was sure of it. A prowler or a thief or... I went over to the window and peered into the darkness. Yes, there was a figure below me. An ominous, frightening figure, and I had to keep him from breaking into the house. I don't remember taking the gun... But it was in my hand, and as I raised it, I seemed to hear the voice of the astrologer beating against my brain. The stars reveal that you are going to kill a man. The stars reveal that you are going to kill a man. I knew then that the stars had told the truth. My fingers closed over the trigger. <laughs> You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. For the surprising conclusion of Horoscope, 
starring Miss Marjorie Reardon, a Hamilton Whitney production written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt and directed by Frank K. Danzig. The gun dropped from my nerveless fingers. And then, as the little acrid gray puffs of smoke circled upward, I rushed down the steps and out onto the porch. A man was crumpled on the floor. A man wearing a white turban that was slowly staining red. His breath came in short gulps and rattled with a dying sound. As a cloud drifted away from the moon, I saw the face of the person I had shot. It wasn't a thief. It was Mr. Arand. Uh, Madame, I am so glad. So glad I have time to see you. I had... To tell you... Don't try to talk. I'll get a doctor. No, please. It is too late. I I knew you would be worried and frightened, madame. So I came to tell you not to be concerned. The stars do not say that you will kill anyone. I, I made a terrible mistake. I am so sorry... I I read you the wrong horoscope. (laughs) Horoscope starred Miss Marjorie Reardon. Listen soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. This program was transcribed in Hollywood. The Lord of the Elements wants to change reality. He's enlisted the evil Zeltan to help him, and together they'll try to recruit Stanley, a man gifted with incredible imaginative capabilities to help them. Unless Edward and his friends can stop them, that is. A tale of white and black magic, quantum physics, and a plot that twists and turns. If you like science fiction, fantasy, and horror, you'll love The Last Observer, A Magic Battle for Reality by G. Michael Vasey. Narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample of The Last Observer on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Unsolved Mysteries. The Borden case is undoubtedly without parallel in the criminal annals of America. It is perhaps the most puzzling murder which has occurred anywhere in the whole world. The perpetrator of this double murder was saved from the gallows by a most extraordinary chain of circumstances. Circumstances which perhaps would not recur in a thousand years.
boarding place in Fall River, Massachusetts, was a house of silences. A house of moody, brooding silences brought about by pent-up hatreds, petty jealousies, niggardly dealings in money matters, and two daughters who hated their stepmother. A stepmother who hated with equal intensity her two stepdaughters. Even from the outside, the Borden house where it stood on South Main Street had about it an air of ineffable doom. The atmosphere of a place accursed. It is exactly 30 seconds before 11 o'clock on the morning of August the 4th. Bridget, the maid, finished with her morning duties, is resting in her room on the third story. Mr. Borden is lying on the couch in the living room. Emma Borden is away from home. And Lizzie... Lizzie Borden is standing on the back porch. Bridget! Bridget! Come here! What's the matter, Miss Lizzie? Come down quick. Father's dead. Somebody came in and killed him. Don't go in, Bridget. Don't go in. Get a doctor. Run across the street and get Dr. Bowen. Is there anything wrong, Lizzie? Oh, Mrs. Churchill, someone has killed Father. Please, please come over. I'll be over right away. The doctor isn't home. I left word for him to come. Miss Lizzie, where were you when this happened? I was out in the yard. I heard a groan. The screen door was wide open. I came in. Lizzie, Lizzie, where is your father? In the living room. Where were you, Lizzie, when it happened? I went to the barn to get a piece of iron. Where is your mother? I don't know. She had a note to go see someone who was sick. It must have been in town. But I thought I heard her come in. I don't know, but what she may have been killed, too. Father must have an enemy. What's all this, Lizzie? What's it they hear about your father? It's Dr. Bowen. And he has Officer Allen with him. Oh, doctor. Doctor, in the living room. All right, all right. Now stand back. Come on, doctor. No, no need to examine him to see whether or not he's dead. Get me a sheet, somebody. How long has he been dead, doc? Mm, about ten minutes. Still warm. Lizzie. Yes, doctor. Where were you when this happened? I was over at the barn. Where were you, Bridget? In my room. Upstairs. Well, did you hear anything? No. Were you asleep? No. I've just been lying down for a few seconds. Now, listen. Nobody could have killed this man the way he's been killed without making some noise. No signs of any weapon either, officer. Let me see your hands, Bridget. That's it. Turn around. Oh, nothing there. You, Miss Lizzie. Let me see your hands. Me? Me? Yes, you. Whoever killed this man must have left some traces. And you were the only two people in the house. There's no signs of blood on Lizzie. Not even inside her body. I've looked, Bridget. You go upstairs and see if Mother's come in. Not alone, Miss Lizzie. I'm not going up those stairs alone. I'll go with you. Oh, Doctor, Doctor Lizzie. Oh. oh, that's, that's Mrs. Borden. Yes, yes. I knew something like this would happen. What? Why? I just did. That's all. Alan. Yes, Doctor. She's Mrs. Borden's been dead anywhere from one hour to two hours, and he's been dead only a few minutes. Yes. Well, every one of you stay where you are. I'm going to search for the weapon. But neither Officer Allen nor any other of the many members of the police force ever found the weapon. Mrs. Churchill, from her window across the driveway, saw no one enter or leave the house. Mrs. Borden, the murdered woman, weighed nearly 200 pounds, yet no one heard a sound when the murderer failed her. Not a sound, not a cry, not a clue, but suspicions, yes... Lizzie Borden lay in prison, staring at the whitewashed ceiling, hearing again and again the same words. Different voices, but always the same words. Where were you, Lizzie Borden, when this happened? 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 The Superior Court of New Bedford on this day, June the 20th, now in session. Chief Justice Albert Mason presiding. All stand while the Justice takes his seat. Mr. Robinson, you may begin your closing appeal to the jury. Gentlemen of the jury, you have heard the witnesses describe the sitting room in which Mr. Borton was killed. Of the walls, the ceiling were splattered with blood. Now, gentlemen of the jury, almost two hours elapsed between the murders. At no time was Miss Lizzie Borden out of the sight of Bridget the Maid or Mr. Borden before his death for a period of more than 20 minutes. How could she cleanse herself of bloodstains in that length of time? I repeat, how could she cleanse herself of bloodstains in that length of time? She could not. Now remember that according to the state, Lizzie Borden must have killed her stepmother about 9.30, got rid of the weapon, cleansed herself, and appeared before Bridget the maid before 9.45.
Again, she had between 10.45 and 11 o'clock in which to kill Mr. Borden, again dispose of the weapon, and again cleanse herself of bloodstains. Impossible, gentlemen of the jury, impossible. Within 15 minutes of Mr. Borden's death, Lizzie Borden was examined by Mrs. Churchill, who stated that there were no bloodstains on Lizzie Borden's person, not even inside her bodice. I have finished. I ask that you think carefully and seriously upon the evidence presented when you return your verdict. The district attorney may address the jury. <clears throat> Gentlemen of the jury, the defense contend that Lizzie Borden did not have time to cleanse herself after killing her stepmother. <clears throat> now that is something that no one can say. The medical testimony cannot and does not specify the exact moment at which Mrs. Borden was struck down. And Lizzie Borden may have had ample time in which to rid herself of the tell-tale bloodstains. In regard to the killing of Mr. Borden, I admit the difficulty. I cannot answer it. You cannot answer it. But, gentlemen of the jury, Lizzie Borden was the only person who could have committed the double murder. And so I say to you, gentlemen of the jury, as presiding judge in this case, that if the state have not proved their case, then you must find for the prisoner and return a verdict so. You may retire to consider your verdict. While the jury retire to consider their verdict, consider the case. It is not easy to remove bloodstains. Bloodstains can be removed more or less easily from the smooth skin of the face, but from the hands, no. Remember, too, that there was no bathtub in the Borden home. Do not lose sight of the fact that no weapon was found, no burned clothes were found, and the murderer must have been literally saturated with the victim's blood. Consider, too, that at any moment Bridget, the maid, or Mr. Borden could have walked upstairs and discovered the murderer killing Mrs. Borden. The jury have been out almost an hour. It is 4.30, and they file to their places in the jury box. Are the gentlemen of the jury agreed upon a verdict? We are, Your Honor. Lizzie Borden, stand up. Face the jury. We, the jury, find the prisoner not guilty. A careful reading without emotion or favor of the trial transcript must convince any unprejudiced person that Lizzie Borden did not commit the double murder. Since this is an unsolved mystery, any solution is necessarily a supposition based, however, upon the known facts. A possible solution will be presented after you have heard from your sponsor. <laughs> two occasions previous to the Borden murders, the Borden home had been robbed of jewelry and money. Stray tramps had probably perpetrated the robberies, and remember that these gentlemen of the highway leave secret markings on walls and houses informing their brothers of the road that these houses are easy to rob, or perhaps a mark that tells that the householder is kindly and that food will be forthcoming. It is the morning of the murder. Lizzie? Lizzie? Yes, Mother? I'm going to town to visit a friend who isn't feeling well. Now, Mother? I'm going to my room to dress first. Have Bridget wash the windows. Yes, Mother. 
Bridget. Oh, Bridget. Yes, Miss Lizzie? I'm going to do some ironing. Will you wash the windows? Yes, Miss Lizzie. I've got the water and everything ready now. I'm going right outside. <laughs> Both of the irons won't be hard for quite a spell. I'll go to the barn and get the lead to make these sinkers for my fishing line. A tramp hidden in the basement since early morning makes his way into the house. This is his opportunity for petty theft. The house is empty, he thinks. In the upper room, he comes face to face with Mrs. Borden. He silences her unuttered cry with a blow. Panic seizes him and he turns to flee. Escape is impossible. Lizzie Borden has returned from the barn and tremblingly the murderer hides in the same room where his victim lies dead. Here's your father, Miss Lizzie. I'm going up to my room for a few minutes. Very well, Bridget. Oh, hello, Father. Uh-oh. Hello, Lizzie. Can you mail for me, Father? Well, not a thing, Lizzie. I'm tired. I think I'll lie down for a bit on the sofa. No, all right. I'm going out to the barn for a piece of iron. The murderer, still hidden in the upper room, hears the door slam. He creeps downstairs to the living room, sees Mr. Borden on the sofa, and thinking he's asleep, tries to creep past him. Borden looks up, sees the blood-stained figure, but like Mrs. Borden, he is silenced with a blow before he can say a word. The back door creaks. Lizzie is returning. In a moment, the hue and cry will be raised. The murderer's only chance is to hide in the basement and wait for an opportune moment to escape. And so Fall River had an unsolved mystery. For the police, despite a statement that a murderer could have entered the house through the basement, didn't even look in the basement till the next day. And the murderer had, of course, made his escape in the dark of the previous night. <laughs> Dogs, Billy Big Rigs, Big Strappers, Flatbed Cowboys, Freight Shakers, Trucklets, 18 Wheelers, Deadheads, Yard Dogs, got your ears on? Whatever you call yourselves or whatever call sign or moniker is thrust upon you, this episode's dedicated to all you truckers driving the boulevard, keeping our bellies full, shelves stocked, septics cleaned, and brains entertained with what you're hauling. In the eyes of this ratchet jaw, and I'm honored to have you listening. Maybe once in a while grab your CB, head to Sesame Street, and tell other drivers how to join this weirdo convoy. Appreciate it. May your brake checks be few, your shutter trouble be absent, and your bear bites non-existent. Keep it cool on the stool. This is Spooky Santa, and I'm 10 and on the side. Presented by Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them into the unknown. Dark Venture. Tonight's venture in the dark features Betty Lou Gerson and David Ellis in Cover Up, the story of a woman who set out to find the killer of the man she loved. Dark Venture is brought to you by the Wild Root Company, makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. 
But first, a word about a hair tonic that is the choice of men everywhere. South of the border, the girls say, Que guapo. North of the border, they say, How handsome. But everywhere, girls admire the man whose hair is groomed the Wild Root way. For Wild Root cream oil is famous for keeping your hair in trim the way girls like to see it neat and natural. There's not a drop of alcohol in Wild Root cream oil. What's more, it contains lanolin. So get the big economy size bottle at your drug or toilet goods counter. And ask your barber for Wild Root cream oil again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now tonight's dark venture, Cover Up. I will tell exactly what happened and the orders that have happened from the moment I arrived in Munich, February 2nd of this year. I went directly from the railroad station to a three-story tenement that had been badly scarred by bombs. I found the name Hans Brunner under one of the doorbells. I pushed the bell and waited. Finally, upstairs in the hallway, I heard a door open. Yes, what is it? I want to see Hans Brunner. Come on up, second floor. The hallway was lit by a single gas jet. There was an odor, a depressive odor of decay. As I passed the first floor landing, I stopped for breath. I was startled to see a man leaning in the doorway of the first floor apartment. A huge red-faced man in a gray sweater reading a newspaper. He didn't even look at me. Why so slow? Come on up. It's cold in the hall. I went up the second flight upstairs more quickly. A younger man was waiting for me. He was carrying a gun in a shoulder holster. Don't let the gun bother you. Come in. Well, I... Come in. Now, what do you want? Hans Brunner. I'm Hans Brunner. What is it? You must forgive me, but since I've never seen you before... You want to see my identification papers? Yes. Why? I'm Elna Karl from Berlin. Oh, I see. The famous Elna Karl. Famed not only for her work in the underground during the war, but also for her beauty. Her magnificent golden hair. But I've never seen you before either, Elna. And many women have golden hair. So? So we will exchange papers. Here are mine. And mine. Well, your picture doesn't flatter you. So you have located Eric Stromer. I know where he is. Those of us who are left have decided that Stromer will not be turned over to the Allied authorities. Why? As you know, Stromer signs a death warrant for every one of our group who died. It has been decided this once. We will allow ourselves the luxury of vengeance. And I have been named the Avenger. Is that what you came here to tell me? Yes. Good. Strom is the cleverest of the lot. If you were given over to the occupation authorities, he'd find some way of squirming through. Eric Strom. His name is like acid on the tongue. Have you ever seen him? No. No, no of course not. They plastered pictures of Hitler and Gang on every billboard, but Stromer, Stromer, he was a great believer in seclusion. Here. Yeah. Is his picture in this billfold. So this is Stromer. Clipped it out of a newspaper. The day my father was beheaded with the command of Eric Stromer. Where is Stromer now? In a shepherd's hut in the Wittenberger Forest, 300 miles south. But every mile of the way he is well protected. By whom? These Nazi werewolves. He's their last great hope. But the occupation armies. The occupation armies. Let me tell you about one fanatic in particular. Roaming the streets of Munich this very moment. His name is Felscher. He's one of the monstrosities we Germans have given to the world. He's a fat, red-faced lump. With no nerves, no heart. But with enough strength in each hand. Wait. What? It's the man I saw in the doorway of the first floor apartment. What man? First floor apartment has been sealed up for months. He was very fat. His face was flushed. He was wearing a gray sweater. You stay here. You'll see why I have such affection for this gun. He's not in the hall now. But I saw him in that first floor doorway right down there. Let's go back to the apartment. How could Felcher have known anything? He may have followed me from the station. Then how could he have been here ahead of you? I don't know. 
Within an hour, every rat and every swine in Munich will know you're here. Start back for Lynn on the first train you can get. I'll leave for Eric Stromer at once. Wish me luck. No need to wish luck. I will know how things come out. What do you mean? I'm going with you. I'm afraid not. Those are my orders. There are to be two of us. Why did they choose you? Perhaps because I have such a splendid reason for killing Herr Stromer. Oh? I chose my wedding day to murder the man I love. I'm going with you. Do you have a gun? Yours will do. I will be satisfied to be a spectator. Felcher is spreading the word about us right now. If we're to have any chance at all, we'll have to completely lose our identity. And once we begin, once we begin, there's no turning back. You know that, too. Yes. All right. Then let us begin. And the car. <laughs> We purchased false identification papers. and became Hilda and Ernst Schiller. Then we went to the public square where the black market operated in the open. So I traded my raincoat and scarf, those are wristwatches, the satin gloves, her scissors, a pair of reading glasses, a bottle of dye, and an armful of old clothes. We wrapped everything in a bundle. I went to a small hotel. Here we are, Mr. and Mrs. Schiller. Room 34. Thank you. I've been a clerk here for a very long time, and I always pride myself on being able to tell what's what. I bet I know something about you, too. What do you mean? <laughs> it's your honeymoon, isn't it? Why? Why, isn't that remarkable, Ernst? I'm the world. Yes. Uh, I got my ways. I got my ways. <laughs> I'll leave you alone now. Well, if you want anything, uh, just tone down. Now, look, Elna. We can get a train out of here for the south at five o'clock tonight, so we can't waste any time. Put the bundle down. Sit here. What? What are you going to do? What are you doing with those scissors? You're not going to like it, Elna. What? When a man looks at you, the things he remembers clearest is this long golden hair. Well? Say goodbye to it. We've got to change our appearance completely. If only I... Yes? Nothing. Go ahead. Start cutting. You'd like to cry, wouldn't you? No. Poor Elna. You're thinking of how he used to look at your hair. How he used to kiss it. I'm thinking of Eric Stroma. He cut my hair very short, then dyed it gray. While it dried, he shaved off his mustache, touched his own hair with gray. Then he went into the bathroom, changed clothes. When he came out, I felt a kind of chill in my heart. As if someone else had come out. He looked like a seedy old school teacher. Then he finished with me. He wiped the makeup from my face, put the reading glasses on. Now, look at yourself in the mirror. I can't believe it. I, I know it's me, but... Oh, glasses, they are too strong. I, I can't wear them. They give me a headache. All right, take them off for now. But when we're outside, we'll have to wear them. We'll have to do everything right. Yes, I know. I get it. Yes? Mr. Hoop, the room clerk. Yes? There's a man in the lobby asking for Elna Karl and Hans Brunner. So why do you call us? My name is Schiller. What's wrong? Because the man described the people he wanted. And the description with you. Honeymooners, indeed. I'll give you ten minutes to get out of my hotel. But listen ten to me. Ten minutes, and then I call the authorities. All right, all right. Where's this man? He's waiting in the lobby. What does he look like? How a difference does Listen happen? to me. This man, he may belong to the werewolves. Ah, another one of your stories. Is he a fat, red-faced man? Please tell me. It's very important. There's no need to tell you. I'll describe him as perfectly as he describes you. Very well. Belgium. Down the lobby. He followed us. Sir, give us ten minutes to get out. I will soon know if our disguise is as good as we think. 
What do you mean? Give me the bundle of our old clothes. We're going downstairs. But Felsha... This is the chance to find out. We've got to know if they can recognize us before we start. Are you coming, Mrs. Schiller? <laughs> There's Felcher, sitting in a chair, reading a newspaper. He's the one I saw in the hallway. He's looking up. He's seen us. I keep walking toward the door. It's working. He's gone back to his paper. Now we can start for Eric Stomer. <laughs> went to the railway station. Just before we passed through a police inspection, I suggested we had the gun and the bundle of clothes. Luckily, it wasn't found. Then I got another bit of luck. When we boarded the train located in our section, we found the compartment which was meant for six passengers was empty. Well, now you can take off those glasses. Yes. My head feels like a sore thumb. <laughs> They're starting to move. In ten hours, we'll be there. How do you feel? I long for the headache. I'm a little shaky. Oh, no. What is it? Look through the window. Felcher, running for the train. He'll never make it. He did make it. He's on a train. We'll return to our story as soon as Harry Wallstrom has a word with the men. Men, here's important news on good grooming. Better than four out of five new users of Wild Root Cream Oil say they prefer Wild Root Cream Oil to all other hair tonics. Here is new and even more conclusive evidence that Wild Root Cream Oil is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. So if you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? The results were amazing. Better than four out of five said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil gives you the advantages that men consider most important. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally. It relieves annoying dryness and it removes loose, ugly dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Now back to our dark venture for tonight. Cover up. Starting out badly, Anna. With Felsha on board, we'll have to change our plans. We'll have to leave the train at the next stop. But we look so different. I'm certain he didn't recognize us in the hotel. We can't take the chance. It's the first stop was at Gorham. Passengers left the train for what little food they could buy at the refreshment stands. We started walking past the little station. Then we saw Felsha waiting for us. Come on. Across the track. <laughs> We ran down the tracks until I was ready to drop. When we looked back, the station was at least half a mile away. I sat down and rested. After a while, the train was on its way again. As it came by, we flung ourselves to the ground. Felcher hadn't followed us. Was he on the train? We waited till dark and started back to the station at Gorham. A freight train was being loaded by the light of bright red flares. We walked past the freight cars till we found one that was open. Look around. Anybody watching us? No, I don't think so. All right. This freight train's going south. It's as good as any. Here, you take the bundle. I'll boost you up. <laughs> you all right? Yes, yes. When's the last time you ate? This morning. Breakfast. Not much as that. train won't be leaving for a while yet. We'll go to one of those refreshment stands in the station and get us some apples. I wish you wouldn't. We can't ride all night with nothing in our stomachs. I'll be all right. As soon as it was gone... Caused us to fly into the freight car. All that happened that day began catching up with me. I caught myself yawning once I dozed off. I came out of it and 
Time to hear someone approaching the car. Look, this car's open. Where did that happen? These workers you get now, they don't care about anything. Come on, help me lock it. Lock it? I wanted to run to the door and pound on it. I wanted to scream to them to let me out. But I didn't dare. I didn't know what to do. Oh, I could make up my mind. The freight train began moving. Then I ran to the door. Let me out. Let me out! Let me out! Let me out! Let me out. There was... There was no one to hear me. I will not forget that night. I started crawling back. There was nothing else to do. In the darkness, I lost all my sense of direction. If only there had been just a little light. With such a dreadful, suffocated feeling locked up alone. Then I thought I heard someone breathing. It could not be I was alone. Then I heard it again. Is... Anyone else in this car? Answer me. Answer me! There was a girl. She breathed. I held my own breath to hear it better. Then the breathing stopped. I sat rigid, straining, listening. Until I exhaled with a long sigh. Oh. It was me, I have heard. It was me. It was, it was my own breathing. I could not let myself go to pieces. I could not. I could not. Finally, out of sheer exhaustion, I must have fallen asleep. Because the next thing I knew, the train had stopped. The freight car door was being pushed open. Elna. Oh. Happen to you? I'll tell you later. Get the bundle and come over to the door. I have it. Now give me your hands. Now jump. <laughs> Where are we now? Just outside Dranberg. Train stopped at the water tower. What time is it? Not quite midnight. Why did you leave me in that car? Why didn't you come back? I did come back. I was already locked. Train was ready to move. Look at me. I had to ride in an open coal car. I thought we had been separated on the dreadful night. I told you this would be the longest 300 miles anyone ever traveled. But we've gone most of the way, Elna. There's barely 100 miles left between us and Eric Stober. <laughs> After I'd rested a while, we started for Dornberg. We found a bus station where a little group of people waited for a bus that was already five hours late. Finally, at 2.30 in the morning, the bus came. A battered old military bus that would leave us almost at the doorstep of the house we were planning to visit. It was dark in the bus. Very crowded with passengers trying to sleep in the uncomfortable seats. We stood in the aisle for a time, fighting to keep our balance. No need to stand up. What? Yes, I'm talking to you, you and your friend. There are two seats over here. Let's go. Yes, I'm so tired. Thank you very much. We are coming. It's very kind of you to... It's very Don't sure. say anything. Rent your room... You, miss, you can sit next to me. And you, sir, there's room for you right in the back. Yes, all right. Put your bundle under the seat. That's right. I saw you standing up. I thought to myself, now, why shouldn't they be comfortable? <laughs> so I sat next to Felch on the dark. He was eating a melon, cutting off chunks with a large pocket knife, smacking his lips in appreciation, completely at peace with the world. Somehow that made it even more terrible. I wanted to run to the bus driver. I wanted to tell him about Felcher, that it was a Nazi werewolf who hunted down people and killed them. But how did I know about the bus driver? How did I know about anybody on the bus? I ask you, would you like some melon? What? My melon, would you like some? There's plenty. No, no, thank you. And how about you? 
For you, sir, it's very good, you know. Well, I... I guess I am pretty hungry. Help yourself. More than enough. Here, take the whole thing. Cut yourself a good piece. Thank you. And where are you headed for, miss? Oh, didn't you know? I'm going to Wittenberg. Oh, yeah. I hear it's very pleasant this time of the year. Very healthful. I hope so. And have you come far? <coughs> Once you step, shut in. up. Just sit there. So I sat there, like nothing had happened, feeling life leaving the body of the man beside me, feeling his blood seep down across my coat. And then he, he sagged suddenly against me, his head lolling on my shoulder. I felt myself getting ill. Huh? Yes. I can't sit here. I can't stand. You'll have to stand but it. Someone will see. In this darkness, what will they see? He fell asleep. His head fell against your shoulder. I can't told I... you how it would be. Are you sure this was Felcher? Open his shirt. Look closely at the tattoo on his left shoulder. There's enough light for that. I can't. Here, I'll open it for you. There. <laughs> now look close so you can see. The swastika. The mark of those who belonged to the Gestapo in the old days. The mark of the werewolf. He was Eric Stromer's right hand. Eric Stromer. The man who killed your lover on your wedding day. Or have you forgotten? Now can you sit beside him? Yes. <laughs> It was almost three hours. Felcher's body sagged against me. I was just about crazy by the time the bus stopped. The driver called. We were to Wittenberg. We were the only ones leaving. Hans cut his bundle from under the seat. I pushed Felcher's body against the window. And we started out of the bus. Every step of the way, I expected someone to stop us. But no one did. The bus pulled away, leaving us standing in the cold dawn. It's half a mile from town. All right. How are you feeling? Fine, fine. You've been through a lot. It will be worth it. Let's go. There's the hut. There in the trees. At last. I'll take the gun out of the bundle. Come. Great moment, Elna. Yes. Who's there? Anyone besides? He lives alone. Here's the door. Locked. The glass breaking. No, no, it would wake him. This is better. It's empty. You were wrong. Stroma isn't here. I was not wrong. Eric Stroma is here. And in this room. What? Welcome to my humble dwelling, Elna Karl. You? Yes. I am Eric Stromer, not Hans Brunner. Wait, you're forgetting this gun. You're not leaving. Why did you bring me here? This was best, the safest way. Also, it provided me with such pleasant aversion. I don't get much of that these days, you must forgive me. It was so delightful to watch you change before my very eyes. From a beautiful, confident disciple of this new democratic Germany to a weary, terrified, rather ugly creature. <laughs> you had to bite your lips to keep from sobbing when I cut your lovely hair, didn't you, Elna? For my part, I had to bite my lips to keep from laughing in your face. Oh, and the glasses. Glasses, Elna. They give you a dreadful headache. <laughs> That's what they might. And your hours in the freight car and Felcher's cold head resting on your shoulder. Felcher? Then he wasn't? Oh, yes. yes. Felcher was a Nazi, all right. One of my trusted followers. How else do you think he was able to follow us? Why do you think he gave me the melon with his knife? And when you told the hotel clerk about him, I fear you destroyed his usefulness. And what about me? I would like to spare you, Elna. Despite your rather tattered appearance, I think it would be pleasant Unfortunately, it would also be extremely dangerous. And so... So you are going to kill me? Yes. Now, Elna. 
now. <laughs> well, what's wrong? What did you do to this gun? What did you think I did, Eric Stromer? When you left your bundle in the freight car, I found the gun and I took the bullets out. <laughs> You knew about me. Yes, I knew about your eyes from the beginning. I'll still kill you. No, I don't I'll think so. It's also body tag against me. I found he had a gun. This gun has Elna. Gun. all the bullets I need. Elna, now listen to you, me. You listen to me. I have listened to you in these last moments of your life. No, Elna. Yes. I knew you were a The moment I saw you in the doorway of Hans Brunner's apartment, you found out he discovered your hiding place here on this voice, didn't you? You found out he'd been appointed to hunt you down and kill yes, you. Yes, Elna, but, but listen to me. But you couldn't take any chances, so you came to Munich to kill Hans Brunner before he could kill you. You had just finished killing him, allowing the bell. Hadn't you, Stroma? <laughs> Elna. Hadn't you? Yes. And you would have killed me there in that apartment, too, if I showed the slightest signs I know you weren't Hans Brunner. Yes, Elna, that, that's all very true, very true, but still you... You can't shoot me in cold blood. I, I told you I had a very blood. good reason for killing you. That you murdered the man I loved. On the day we were to be married. But Anna, listen to me. That was, that was long ago. That was long, long ago. Long ago. Yesterday was to have been my wedding day. Yesterday. <laughs> the man I love. The man I come to Munich to marry. Was Hans Bruno. Tonight's dark venture was written by Larry Marcus and directed by Leonard Reed. Next week at the same time, the Wild Root Company, makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the Hair, will bring you another original dark venture story. In the meantime, remember, the man who makes the best impression is the man who puts good grooming first. And you can do that, fellows, by using Wild Root Cream Oil. This grand non-alcoholic hair tonic is again and again the choice of men who put good grooming first. And here's why Wild Root Cream Oil is so popular. It gives a man everything he wants in a hair tonic, grooms his hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, Wild Root Cream Oil contains soothing lanolin that's so much like the oil of your skin. And remember, no other leading hair tonic gives you all of these advantages. So take Wild Root's FN test. If you find signs of dryness or loose dandruff, you need Wild Root Cream Oil again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. In tonight's dark venture, Betty Lou Gerson was heard as Elma, David Ellis as Stromer, Leo Clary as Felcher, Jack Moyles as a trainman, and Earl Lee as the hotel clerk. Original music by Rex Corey. Your narrator has been John Lake. Until next Tuesday, remember, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too, for quick, good grooming and to relieve dryness between permanent. Mothers say it's great for training children's hair. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Fresh Roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked.
In this cave by the restless sea, we are met to call from out the past stories strange and weird. Bell keeper, pull the bell so all may know we are gathered again in the weird circle. again their immortal tale, The Hauler. It was a dark house, dreary too. Shadows crept down the walls like loathsome vermin. The house was old and filled with memories of better days, like the man who lived there. He was old and gnarled and alone. He'd pass the lonely hours by sitting on the porch of his home, watching the boats sail up and down the river. He was happy living alone in that old house, until one day a tall, three-rigged Brazilian schooner floated past his shores, casting a shadow on the banks of the river. A shadow over the old house. A shadow over the old man. A living shadow which crept into his mind. He wrote a letter to his young cousin, Madame René Sable who was living in Paris, begging her to visit him. She read the letter over several times, then took it to a friend of hers, a doctor, Dr. Caron, to ask his advice. She was young and in Paris, and she didn't believe in the old man's shadow. I had to come to you, Dr. Caron, because this letter worries me so. You've known my cousin, Gabrielle Bouvet, for a long time, and he's not the sort of man given to hallucinations. He seems to be a very sound old man. But living alone the way he does... Nonsense. Living alone has nothing to do with it. But suppose you read me the letter, Madame Sarr. Of course. It all seems like so much poppycock. Listen. Be honored by a visit from you at your earliest convenience. <laughs> Isn't that like him? Yes, very much. <laughs> You'll find me a changed man, my dear changed because he has come. You don't know what I'm talking about, and so I must explain. A shadow has crept into my home, a shadow which dominates me. You see what I mean, Doctor. Well, read on, Renee. Right. He is a creature from a land of shadows, but I tell you, he does live. He lives here with me, and I'm afraid of him. Oh, Rene, he will dominate all of mankind, just as mankind has dominated the animal kingdom. We will become his chattel, his food and his slave, as the animals become ours. You see, Doctor? Yes, indeed I do. I wonder... Rene, how soon can you pack and be ready to leave? In about two hours. Well, fine. I'll have the horse and buggy hitched and call for you then. I think we'd better go down to him as soon as possible. Uh, Doctor, surely you don't believe in this, this invisible creature. Well, surely, Rene, I don't doubt the wind just because I can't see it. We'll be able to judge better after we have a talk with him. You better hurry home. I'm going right down to the stables now. It's been a long trip, Doctor. I hope we don't frighten my cousin by coming at this hour. That's his house right over there, isn't it? Yes, right at the end of the road. Huh. Gloomy looking old place. Very gloomy. It's so dark and so very old. Tell me, how long has Bouvet's wife been dead? About six years now. Did you notice any perceptible change in him after she died? Mm, nothing exceptional, except he became quieter and drew into himself more, mm -hmm. if that's possible. Well, here we are. Yeah. Oh, there, boy. Oh. And so the doctor and the old man's cousin, Renee's son, entered the old house expecting to find a man weakened by illness, haggard with lack of sleep. But instead, Gabriel Bouvet was in high spirits as he conducted his guests into the house. He made a special pot of tea, and then as he passed the cream and sugar. 
Take your tea, Renee. Stop being so nervous. Fidget, fidget. Always were a fidgety youngster. Makes me nervous. You were talking about the Brazilian boat, Monsieur Bouvet. What has the boat to do with this unknown shadow? You don't know, then? Frankly, no. Well, here. Look at this book. Well? Study of a scientific world. Open it. My eyes aren't as good as they used to be, or I'd read it to you myself. Page 72. What is this to do with the shadow which you see? Allow your friend the doctor to read the second paragraph. Oh. Well, listen to this, Rene. Sao Paulo, Brazil. A contagious madness has spread throughout Sao Paulo. The victims claim they are being possessed by creatures of darkness who feed only on milk and water. Medical servants have been rushed to their aid. But that's in Brazil, cousin. I know, I know. That the Brazilian boat sailed by my door. It's possible for this, whatever it is, to have escaped from the boat. Well, anything's possible, but this does seem a little improbable. But possession, that's talking of demons. This is a modern world. No one man can possess the power of ordering another's will. How little you know, cousin. Well, perhaps I am a fool of a girl, but anybody... No, not anybody, Rene. Not me, for instance. I believe in hypnotics. That's mm. possession of a kind. Dr. Mesmer's nonsense. I don't believe in mesmerism. Well, I can prove it to you simply enough. How? If you're willing, we'll try a little experiment. You hypnotize? If you'll be a subject. Why, of course I will. That sounds like fun. Can I help in any way, Doctor? Yes, just uh, blow out the candle. All but one. Certainly. I'll leave the corner candle on. All right now, Rene, if you'll close your eyes. My eyes are closed. And try to sleep. Sleep. There. Candles are out. All but one. Now, sleep, my dear. Try to sleep. Doctor, listen. Listen to that. What? What, monsieur? It's in the room. I know it is. It's here, next to me, watching me. Can't you hear it crying, crying? This is madness. You don't believe me, do you? Stop the experiment at once. Listen. Listen. Cousin, please. What makes you think mankind is the final answer to life? Perhaps there is a higher form of life. A form of life which can possess us and then destroy us. Isn't that possible, Doctor? Well, yes, anything is possible. Then take my word for it. Humanity is lost unless we destroy it. Look. I always carry a knife with me, waiting for the time. I can destroy him. Listen. It's come for me. Come for possession of me. It's come. It's the horror. The horror. And it's come. Doctor, won't he ever wake up? He's been unconscious for over an hour. Well, it's best to let him sleep right now, my dear. This is an exhausting emotional strain for a man of his years. But what can we do? As soon as his heartbeat is normal, I'll take him back to the Paris hospital. You'll have to stay here for a few days and close the house. Just pack his belongings and bring them on to Paris as soon as you can. Anything you say, Dr. Perron. Well, come, Rene. We must let him sleep. I'll prepare the coach for the return journey. And so they left him, lying on the old bed in his room. And the shadows on the walls cast purple shadows on his gnarled hands. And the hands clutched the air and thrashed the sheets as if the old man were fighting. Fighting a being, fighting a presence, fighting for possession of his own will. The old man's face was a mask of horror. And then the wind, that strange, unholy wind, started to sneak in the room. It oozed through the door, the keyhole, and the window. It slid to the bedside. <laughs> no, no. You're possessed, possessed and down. I know you watch me night and day. Night and day, night and day. But I'll get away from you. I've got to get away from you. I won't give in without a struggle. You'll have to give in because nobody believes you, believes you, believes you. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Watching you, watching you, watching you. Leave me you. alone. I'll never leave you alone, never, never, never. But I shall be free of you. You can't be free of me. I'm part of you. If I stay here, 
They'll call you mad. They'll call you mad. But if I leave the house... You'll die. I'll leave you here. You can't follow me. I'll go far away. So far, nobody will find me. Oh, I've got one hand on your heart, Bouvet, and one in the room. If you leave, your heart will be torn from you, torn from your body, torn from your soul. <laughs> Hey, is anything the matter? I heard him scream, too. Huh? Doctor, look at him. Oh. His face is, is dead white. Yes, well, you're quite right. I'll have to risk moving him now. I don't think we ought to leave him in this house any longer. But how can you travel alone with him? Well, I'll manage somehow. I'll carry him to the buggy. He can sleep as we drive along. I can manage somehow. That is, if you don't mind staying here alone. Well, I don't mind, Doctor. I've no patience with superstitious nonsense. Fine. Here, my dear, help me wrap him in this blanket. Of course, Doctor. Ah, there, that's fine. Now, hand me that other blanket over there. Here you are. That'll keep him warm on the journey. I'll send the coach back from Paris tomorrow evening to pick you up. You ought to be able to leave here by then. Don't worry about me, Dr. Perron. I'll be all right. That's what she thought then. But even as the doctor carried the old man out of the house to the carriage, a premonition of fear, a foreboding, reached out from the gathering shadows in the walls and left her trembling and weak. The doctor placed the old man in the carriage. And then that journey... And the return to Paris started. They had traveled for about an hour. But they awakened, sobbing out. You've taken me away. Away from my house, you fool. Bouvet, you must not excite yourself. Put his hands on my heart and he's pulling on it, pulling on it. Doctor, take me back before I die. Oh, nonsense, Bouvet. You must get away from that place. Take me back. Take me back, Doctor. You don't understand. Bouvet, sit down. You think I'm mad, don't you? But the hall exists. They exist, and I'll die if I don't return. Will you try to rest, monsieur? We're doing everything we can for Turn you. Turn this carriage around, doctor, and return to the house. Bouvet, put those reins Did you down. Me? Let go of the reins, you fool, before you take us off the road. Turn the carriage around. No, uh, or I shall plunge this knife into you. Bouvet, put that knife down. Put that down. Uh, that will teach you to interfere with a hauler, doctor. Oh, that will teach you. Oh. 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 Now, get out of this carriage, doctor. But Bouvet! Before I plunge the dagger into your heart. Bouvet! Bouvet, you can't leave me here like this. I, I must I, leave you here. I, I must return to the house at once to uh, destroy him. But he doesn't exist except in your own mind, Bouvet. He exists, and I'm going to him. Bouvet! Doctor! Doctor! <laughs> Dead. I'm coming, master. Yeah. I'm coming, master. I'm coming to destroy you. Just as I destroyed him. So Bouvet drove off in the rambling carriage, leaving the badly wounded doctor lying on the roadside, more dead than alive. Bouvet drove furiously through the night to a little shack about a half mile from his home. There was a sign on the shack, a sign reading, Litau's expert lockmakers and ironworkers. Bouvet pulled the carriage up in front of the door and walked to the entrance of the shack. Monsieur Litau! Monsieur Latau. Who? Who's calling at this? Oh, Monsieur Beauvais. What are you doing at this hour of the night? Beauvais? Oh, yes, yes, doing, of course. I need your help, that's what. My help? What can a poor man like me do for a wealthy man like you? You can make a lock for me. I've got to lock the doors of my house securely. The front and back doors and the windows. All the windows in my house. I must be locked and bolted, Latau. Tonight? Yes, tonight, you fool. Of course, tonight. But in heaven's name, why? To lock him out. Out of my home, out of my life. Y you're Into not... an eternity. Y you're not feeling well. Come, Latau. Don't bicker with me. Hurry, man. I'm prepared to pay any price you ask. Of course. She'll be as you say if you'll only just give me time to get my instruments together. Of course, but hurry, Latau. Hurry. He's waiting for me now. 
Monsieur Letao and the old man returned to the lonely old house by the river in the dead of the night. They crept into the house and worked in the half-darkness near the shadows. And that strange, unholy wind was quiet and didn't disturb them while they worked. Bouvet felt safe and free for a while, only a while. And a girl slept upstairs, slept undisturbed and quiet. The hours passed this way, passed quietly, as the locksmith worked. And the old man muttered. Hurry. Hurry, Lita, hurry. It's almost morning, man. I'm hurrying as fast as I can. I'm almost done, except for the windows in your cousin's room. Now don't worry about her. I'll wake her up when the time comes. Finish that lock, man. Just two more nails will hold it in place. Good, good, good. Two more nails. Two more nails. Yep. Yeah. 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 There you are. Gabriel, what are you doing here? Oh, good morning, youngster. Good morning, my dear. But the doctor, the doctor was to take you. Away from my house. But he couldn't, Rene. Where is the doctor? In Paris. He's going to return this evening after my work is done. Yes. <laughs> yes. A job in life. Kill the whole. The doctor let you return alone? He had to let me. Because I wasn't alone. Well, who is this? I'm Monsieur Littau, Mademoiselle, the most famous lockmaker in the world. I don't understand all this. Naturally, my dear. Come along, Littau. You must finish your work. Only two more locks to fix tonight. And I'll be able to lock them in and kill them. Kill them. Hell, what are you staring at me for? Go ahead to my cousin's room and start to work. Of course, I'll start right away. Gabriel. Gabriel. Look at me, cousin. I'm looking at you, Renee. I see you. Are you lying to me? Why should I lie to you? What did you do to the doctor? Nothing, nothing, Renee. That knife in your belt. What about that knife in your belt? I always carry a knife to protect me against, against the horror. There's blood on that knife, Gabrielle. What did you do? Be quiet, oh, Cousin, am I all gone? I can't let you go. What are you going to do to me? I have to bind you up. Tie her to a chair until I've killed him. Don't you understand? <laughs> yes, I'm old, but I'm strong, cousin. Stronger than you. Oh, no, don't struggle against me. Gabriel, you in trouble? I thought I heard you. You heard nothing. Nothing, monsieur. Go back to work. Yeah, oh, come along, cousin. I'll have to tie you in the kitchen where you'll be out of harm's way until he's dead. Bouvet dragged his cousin to the kitchen and then taking a stout rope tied her to the kitchen table by the sheer strength of a maniac, tied her securely and then threw a tablecloth over her, smiling to himself. He left the kitchen and went to the upstairs room to watch Latau finish the work of the night. Are you finished, Monsieur Latau? Yes, yes, of course. Yes, I'm finished. Here. Here you are, Latau. Two hundred francs for one night's work. Good pay, isn't it? Very good pay, Monsieur Bouvet. Very good pay. Anything more I can do, sir? Have you locked the locks? All locked securely, Monsieur. I'm glad. Hey, Latau, what are you waiting for? Why don't you go home? I, uh, I thought I ought to say good night to the There's other... There's no need to. I'll say good night for you. I hear nothing. Naturally. You hear nothing. Good night, Monsieur Bouvet. Lita, may I caution you against one thing? Of course. Don't tell anybody of this work tonight. Do you understand? Don't tell anybody. Of course I understand. Good night. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Your locks can't lock me out. You. You again. I've been watching you and your lockmaker. Watching you and your locks are useless. Locks are useless, useless. But I can lock you in when I escape. Impossible, because I am with you constantly. And I'll destroy you, Horla. With a knife? No. With fire and flame. I'll set the entire house on fire and leave you here. Leave you here and I'll escape. You can't escape. You're part of this house. You said so yourself. Did I now? How interesting. How interesting. How very interesting. And you'll burn to death. You'll burn to death. And the world will be free of the horror. Are you so sure, Bouvet? Are you so sure? <laughs> I'll pour oil on the walls and on the rugs and on the floor. Where's the oil? In the kitchen closet. Yes, in the kitchen closet. That's where it is. Don't forget I'm part oh, of no. you. no. He'll be destroyed by fire. And while the frantic, distraught old man poured oil on the rugs and on the walls, the Tau walked slowly home, 
worrying about his old friend Bouvet, worrying about the strangest actions he'd ever seen, worrying and trying to fit together the odd pieces of the puzzle in his mind. Halfway home, he heard a voice cry out, Somebody help! Help before it's too late! Who is it? Oh, but it's the doctor. In oh. heaven's name, what has happened to you? Help me. Oh, you're badly wounded. Here, oh. allow me to help you stand on your feet. Uh. There now. Oh, I'm so weak. What's happened? The madman, Bouvet. I was trying to take him to a hospital and he, he stabbed me. Madman? <clears throat> I thought so. I just finished making two dozen sets of locks for him in his house. Little, is Madame Saab still there? Yes, I thought I heard her cry out, but I wasn't sure. Well, we must get help to her immediately. That madman will do anything. Anything. Yeah, let me carry you, monsieur. Uh, uh, put your arm over my shoulder if you can. Uh, we'll get help as soon as possible. Hurry. Hurry, Lita. Hurry, man. Yeah. Now I've poured oil over the entire house. Yes. The entire house. The curtains, the ceiling. Even the beds and walls and the chairs. Now for a match. Yes, one match. One match in the house will go up in flames. Flames. And you will be dead. Uh, will I be dead? Will I? <laughs> I need a match. I need a match. There must be a match in the kitchen. And the house will all be flames. Flames. And you will burn. Burn and die. Yes, the kitchen. Uh, yeah. Don't be nervous, cousin. Don't be nervous. Work is almost done. Almost done. And you'll be dead. The hall will be dead. Dead, yes. Yes, hit the match. Yeah, I'm going to start my flames on the top floor. The top floor? Don't follow me. I don't want you following me. I like to watch you. Up those stairs. Yes. Up the steps to the landing. Uh, will you enjoy watching your own funeral pyre? Uh, fire and flames. Fire and flames. I'm almost to the top now. And then I'll strike my match. And the flames will start. How do you intend to escape? Don't forget your own escape. Yes. yes. I escape my escape. I must escape. I'll unlock the front door and run out. Just in time. And you'll be trapped. Trapped. Here we are. Now, now the match. Light the match. No, no, Bouvet. It's all right. You'll die here. Be careful of yourself. Be careful of yourself. I don't want any harm to come to you, Bouvet. Look. Look. Look, the fire started. Look at the flames. Look at the walls and the shadows. Look at the flames. Now, now for the downstairs. I'm right beside you. Where you go, I go. No, no. You must stay here and die. Don't you understand? Then you will die. You will. Watch out for the flames. Watch out for the flames. I must strike the match down here now. Light the canopy. Like that. How do you like those flames, Ola? How do you like those flames? Be careful of yourself, Bouvet. Be careful of yourself. Now, now one last light here. And the job is done. And I'll wait and escape. At the last minute. And you'll be left. Okay, open up. Open up. Open up. They've come to rescue me. You see, Bouvet, they've come to rescue me. No, no. I won't open up. Hurry, flames. Hurry. Don't let them beat you to the job. I tell you, the girl's in the back of the house. Break the door down. Get the girl. Where is she? She's in the back of the house. Hurry, men. You're all fools. You're allowing the holler to live. You're allowing the holler to escape. Watch out, Bouvet. Right. I've got the go. Oh, he would have died in here. And I would have been free. I'll never leave you, old friend. And I would have been free. Never free of me. Don't you see him? He's standing next to me. Always next to you. Always next to and you. And he should die in the flames. Only if you die in the flames. Watch out, the house of trouble. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. If I die in the flames. Yes, of course. I must die in the flames. Yes, I must die in the flames. And then the horror will be dead. And the old wild-eyed man rushed into the pile of burning timber among his old belongings and perished there. He and the horror perished there. All that remained of the man and the horla was scorched bones and two odd misshapen skulls. Two odd misshapen skulls. Remember that. For there were two skulls 
not one. From the time-worn pages of the past, we have heard the famous story, The Hauler. Bellkeeper, toll the bell. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich. And that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. Wait a minute. Have you heard the strange tales of the Whistler? I'm the Whistler. I don't know what it is. It's a figure. I can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. It comes through the door and walks with outstretched arms toward my bed, reaching for me. Sunday night, and again CBS presents The Whistler. I, the whistler, know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, many secrets hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows... I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And so I tell you the weird tale of jealousy. At the edge of the cliff overlooking the sea sits a grey stone mansion, weather-beaten by the storms of several decades. To this mansion, Gilbert Durant brought his bride, Lucia. That was four years ago. Gilbert and Lucia were quite happy until last year when Lucia's half-sister, Beverly, came to live with them. 
And gradually, something began to happen. At first, Lucia realized that Gilbert's ardor was beginning to cool. He became more absorbed in his writing. Then she felt the cold clamminess of the stone structure almost creep about her and clutch her. Fear grew in her mind, a fear that nearly took her breath. It is evening now, and Lucia, having excused herself at dinner, tosses on her bed in a fretful sleep. No. No. Don't. Don't. Get away from me. Ah! No. 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 What's wrong? Benton. Better come in. What's wrong? Why were you screaming? Benton. I must have been dreaming. It was horrible. Well, you're white as a ghost. You're shaking like a leaf. Yes, I know. Oh, Mrs. Benson, I can't stand it. It's driving me mad. That makes the fourth or fifth time I've dreamed the same thing. The same thing in every detail. I've never heard you scream before. It always comes a little closer to me. Tonight, it, it almost reached me. It? What do you mean? I don't know what it is. It's a figure. A human figure. But I can't tell whether it's a man or a woman. It comes through that door and walks slowly across the room with its arms outstretched, reaching for me. Are you sure you were dreaming? Oh, now that I think of it, it isn't like a dream. An ordinary dream. Its reality seems to carry over even after I'm awake. Oh, that's what's made you so ill. This dream, if it is a dream, means something? Is that what you think? It, it's a premonition? Perhaps. What time is it? Nine o'clock. Where's Gilbert? Your husband went horseback riding over an hour ago. Your uh, sister went with him. Beverly? Why didn't he ask me to go? Well, you know, you haven't been feeling very well lately. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Well, uh, if you're feeling better, I'll go back to my room. Hmm? Oh, oh, yes, I... I'll be all right. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Gilbert and Beverly. <laughs> Lucia lies for a while, staring wild-eyed at the patch of moonlight on the bedroom door. And finally she drops off to sleep. Then as the clock strikes half past ten, the door opens slowly, silently... A figure steps into the room and moves noiselessly through the moonlight to Lucia's bed and stands staring at her. Suddenly, Lucia opens her eyes. Gilbert, don't, don't. Lucia, what's wrong with you? What are you doing in my room? I, I just wanted to know how you felt. How long have you been standing there? Oh, just a few seconds. Oh, I, I was dreaming, I guess. And when I woke up, you startled me. Why were you yelling, don't, don't? I don't know. I, I have the slightest idea. <laughs> I talked to Dr. Hanby about you today. Told him you were run down, and he suggested I get a tonic for you. I'll drop in at the drugstore on my way home tomorrow evening. A tonic? Yes. What is it? Oh, I don't remember. Something, something in strychnine. Strychnine? Yes, he said it would give you an appetite. Where have you been, Gil? Oh, uh, I've been riding. Nice moonlight night. Very pleasant. Did she, uh, did Beverly enjoy it? Yes, she's an excellent rider. I've decided to buy that Philip and Thompson. Going over there tomorrow afternoon. Beverly going with you? Yes, yeah, she's a good judge of horseflesh. Why? Nothing. I just asked. Well, good night, Lucia. See you at breakfast? Uh, yes. Good night. Lucia waits till she hears her husband turn out his light, then slips quickly to her door and quietly down the stairs to the library. With every beat of her pulse, she hears Gil's words. Something, something in Strickland. Something, something in Strickland. She snaps on the light and steps to the shelf holding the encyclopedia. She runs her fingers down the long line of books. L-M-N-O, P to R. And then she stops and stares in terror. The S to T is missing. Lucia glances wildly about the room, and then she sees it there on the desk, the missing volume, and open. She rushes to the desk and stares down at the open page. Good Lord! It's true! It's true! (laughs) 
I'll tell you what, Beverly, I'll leave the deal entirely up to you. Up to me? Oh, Gil, that's not fair. <laughs> Why not? Well, suppose she turns out to be a lemon. I don't think she will, because you're going to have the job of training her. Oh, you certainly flatter me. Not in the least. Oh. Good morning, Lucia. I just realized what time it was. You'll be leaving in a few minutes. Yes, it's nine this very minute. I better step on it. More coffee, Beverly? No, thanks. How do you feel, Lucia? Why, better, much better. You better eat something. No, no, I can't. At least some coffee. Yes, yes, I'll have some coffee. I've got to run. Uh, see you later, Lucia. Yes, Gil. And I'll see you this afternoon at two, Beverly. Yes, I'll meet you in town at two. Oh, uh, Gil, don't forget Lucia's medicine. I won't. Goodbye, Lucia. Are you meeting Gil in town, Beverly? Yes, he wants me to decide on that filly he's interested in. Where did you learn so much about horses? Well, it seems to be natural. Why don't you get interested in horses, Lucia? Why should I? What are you interested in? Well, I'm interested in a few things. My husband in particular. You don't act interested in anything. Really? If you'll take my advice, you'll snap out of this coma and get some pep. Does Gil like women with pep? Eh, No man cares about a woman who sits around and mopes. I think you're a hypochondriac. Do you? You should do something about it. I intend to. I intend to do something about it. (laughs) I'm glad to hear it. Get out and do things. Play games, golf, tennis, swim and ride. Maybe this medicine will fix you up. You know all about it, do you? What is it? Oh, I don't know. It's a tonic, a builder-upper. I wish I could believe that. At least you can try it. It won't hurt you. No? I wonder... Doctor. Well, is it? Why would you call me out here? What's wrong? Uh, I just couldn't make it into town. Oh, it can't be as bad as that. Did Gilbert talk to you about me yesterday? Oh, I saw Gil for a few moments at the club during lunch. Said you were run down. Did, um, did you give him a prescription for me? <laughs> I never do that until I've examined the patient. You didn't give him a prescription? Well, no. What did you suggest for me? Oh, I don't know. Just mentioned a few tonics he might get for you. Spoke of beef, iron, and wine, and sherry and egg, and well, I don't remember what else. Then you mentioned nothing specifically. Don't think so. I see. What seems to be wrong with you, Lisha? I don't know exactly. Something has been happening to me that... Well, frankly, I... I'm afraid I'm losing my mind. Oh, come now. We all feel that way at oh, times. I'm serious. Things happen to me in the night... What sort of things? First, I thought they were just nightmares. But when you have a nightmare, you wake up and the fear is gone. You realize the truth. This vision that comes to me haunts me through the waking hours as well. Vision? Something. I think it's a person who comes through my bedroom door, approaches my bed with outstretched arms as though it intends to strangle me. Each time it comes a little closer. My fear is that eventually it will get to me before I wake up. Hmm. You always dream the same dream? If it is a dream, yes. Who is the person? I don't know. And you don't think it's really a dream? No. I think it's a premonition. Well, have you any basis for such a fear in real life? Is there someone or something that you're afraid of? Doctor, I'm convinced that they're not dreams. And I'm not asleep. Oh, nonsense. I'm positive they're not mere dreams. Well, I think it's all due to your rundown condition. You probably don't sleep as soundly as you should, and so you transfer sounds in the night to dreams, nightmares. That's exactly what I mean. If I'm only half asleep, I may be transferring actual movements and sounds into dreams. In other words, if someone slams the door in the night, I may half hear it and and attribute it to a dream. Yeah, go on. And perhaps I'm not dreaming. I think you'd better come into town and have a thorough physical. You mean a checkup by a psychiatrist? Well, I may have someone to help me. It's a usual thing, you know. Oh. Oh, Dr. Henry. I'm so frightened. Oh, no, 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 no. Everything's going to be all right. I'm afraid. I'm afraid that I'm going to die. That someone is trying to kill me. You're not going to die. That's ridiculous. I'll call you and make an appointment. Very well. In the meantime, try not to think about it. Keep your mind on something on the brighter side. Yes, I'll, I'll try. 
Try Lucia. Try hard to keep your mind on something brighter. But you can't, can you? <laughs> that awful gnawing of jealousy and fear occupy every moment. Gil and Beverly, Gil and Beverly. How could they do such a thing? <laughs> then, as the afternoon fades and dusk sets in, there is a knock at Lucia's door. Are you asleep, Lucia? No, not asleep. How are you feeling? I seem to have developed a headache. Have you eaten anything today? No, I didn't care for anything. Well, this will help them. Better take a dose now. I'll measure it for you. What is it? Why, it's the tonic. Did Dr. Hanby prescribe it? Well, yes. Yes, he did. Where's Beverly? Down in the library. Did you buy the horse? Yes, Beverly thought she was a fine animal. I didn't know Beverly knew so much about horses. She's a horsewoman after my own heart. Is she? Rides like the wind, too. She had intended to go home tomorrow. She's staying on? She's got to. I wouldn't think of her leaving now. Why not? Well, for one thing, she's going to train the horse. And what else? Why, uh, nothing else. Here, take this. It's a little bitter, but you'll get used to it. Gail! Go ahead. It won't hurt you. I don't want it. And why not? It, it has poison in it. Well, I suppose it does have a little, yes, but... Only enough to act as a tonic. I don't want it. I won't take it. I won't. Are you going to act like a child? Take it and quit arguing. I won't. I won't. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I tried to do anything for you and you act like a spoiled kid. I can't take it. You're impossible, Lucia. <laughs> I'm afraid. You need this medicine, but you're too confoundedly stubborn. You'd rather sit around and mope all day. <laughs> Very well, there it is. You can take it or not. Disgusted trying to help you pull out of this. Good night. No. No, 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 wait, Gil. I'll take it. I'll take it. I don't care whether you do or not. There, I've taken it. <coughs> Terribly bitter. And take another dose around 11. Gil, where's Mrs. Benson? Why, I told her she could have the night off. Thought she might like to spend the evening in town. You let her off? Yes, yeah, she's been sticking pretty close lately. Oh, yes. Yes, she has. Good night. Good night, Lucia. <laughs> You look upset. I am. Lucia didn't want to take it. No? Why not? She's afraid of medicine. What are you going to do? She finally took a dose of it. If I know her at all, she'll never take another drop. She's got to take it, Gil. Got to figure out a way to make her take it. It can't be disguised. It's too bitter. Try something else. I'll try and coax her into it again. Isn't there something that tastes more pleasant or something that you could put in milk or orange juice? I don't know. Well, I'll find something. Of course you will. You've got to. I think Mrs. Benson is the cause of her dislike for medicine. She's keeping her upset. I'm going to let Mrs. Benson go for two or three days. And maybe something can be accomplished. I'll speak to her now. Well, Benson. What are you doing standing here in the dark? I, I, I was just going upstairs to see if Mr. Durand wanted anything before I went out. I see. Oh, uh, by the way, I'm staying home for a couple of days, and I thought that since you've been staying so close to the job, you'd welcome a few days' leave. Leave? Why, <laughs> yes, but Mrs. Durant may prefer that I stay. I think you'd better get a little rest yourself. You needn't come back till Friday. But I, I, I don't need a rest. You come back Friday. Yes, very well, sir. I'll run up and see her before I go. going into town for the evening. I'm leaving in a few minutes, but I had to see you. I'm glad you came up. I've got to talk to someone. I know now they're not dreams. They are premonitions. And I know who's trying to kill me. Who? My husband and Beverly. I know. You know? I just heard them talking low in the library. They were talking about the medicine. He said you were too stubborn and probably wouldn't take another dose. And she said he'd have to find some way to make you take it. Then it is poison. They want me out of the way. I got angry because I refused to take it. Oh, oh, yes, and there's something else. He just told me that he would not be going into town for several days and told me not to come back here till Friday. Good Lord. 
I'll go on into town as planned, but I'll slip back toward midnight and come up the back way. And I won't take a thing that gets me. I'll be back at midnight. Thank you, Benson. Good night. Good night, ma'am. <laughs> few minutes before 12, Mrs. Benson returns to the mansion. No lights are burning, so she makes her way quietly through the back entrance, slips up the stairs and taps lightly on Lucia's bedroom door. Mrs. Durant! Mrs. Durant! Then she turns the knob, opens the door and snaps on the light. Mrs. Durant, are you here? Then Benson steps quickly toward the bed. The bed is empty, but a horrible sight meets her eyes. <gasps> Blood. Blood all over the bed. They've done it. They've murdered her. Give me the police department. All right, Mrs. Benson. What happened this evening? Well, earlier in the evening, Mr. Durant told me I could have the night off since I'd been staying close to Mrs. Durant for some time. Mm -hmm. And then later, he said he decided to let me off until Friday. But I didn't want to go, and he insisted. Was there anyone else in the house? Yes, Mrs. Durant's half-sister, Beverly. Did you leave the house? Yes, but I went up and told Mrs. Durant I'd be back about midnight. If you had till Friday, why did you come back at midnight? Because we, we were both frightened. Of what? Well, Mrs. Durant had been having premonitions that someone was trying to kill her. Who was trying to kill her? She didn't know, but she was terribly frightened. Is that all? No. Her husband tried to get her to take some medicine he had brought home. She refused, and he got angry. How do you know he was angry? I I heard him talking about it to Beverly. They were in the library. And he told Beverly that Lucia was very stubborn. And Beverly said that he'd have to think of some other way. Did Mrs. Durant suspect her husband and Beverly of trying to do away with her? Uh, yes, she did. She was convinced that Mr. Durant and Beverly were in love and wanted her out of the way. So you came back tonight because you anticipated that something was going to happen. Yes. Hmm. The house was dark, so I came up the back stairs, knocked on her door, and when I got no answer, I came in, turned on the lights, saw she was gone, and then I saw the bed all covered with blood. She wouldn't take the poison, so they did it another way. That's what they planned in the library. Where are they now? Any idea? Well, they didn't expect me back tonight. So they've probably gone to dispose of the body, intending to come back here and clean the place up later. I see. Anybody else know about Mrs. Durant's fears? Yes. She talked to Dr. Henby. I called him right after phoning the police and told him about it. He knows. Uh, Dr. Henby, Captain Rick, what in the world is the meaning of this? For all indications, Mrs. Durant has been murdered and the body disposed of. Doctor, I understand Mrs. Durant told you that she was afraid that something was going to happen to her. That she was going to die. What? Who told you that? Mrs. Benson here. I see. Well, she did call me in this morning. She'd been having strange dreams. Premonitions, she called them. I called them hallucinations. Who did she think it was? Well, she couldn't tell whether it was a man or a woman, but... Someone was always approaching her bed with outstretched arms. Trying to choke her. Do you think it was more than a dream? Well... Sort of hypochondriac. I asked her to come into town where I could give her a thorough examination. I didn't take her story too seriously, but... Well, this certainly puts a different slant on the entire picture. Yes, we haven't found the body. I have men out searching now. We'll find it. Oh, here's Mr. Durant and his sister-in-law. They found him about a half mile down on the beach. How are you, Durant? What in the world goes on here? Oh, what's wrong, Doctor? Take a look at that bed. Good Lord, what's happened? Lucia. What? Well, where is she? We thought you could enlighten us on that point. What do you mean? Is she dead? Where is she? Gil. Beverly. Gil. Give her oh. some water. She'll be all right in a minute. But what's happened? We think your wife has been murdered. Murdered? Why? What are you doing here, Mrs. Benson? I thought you were gone till Friday. Why did you tell her to go until Friday? Why, I, I thought she needed a rest. She's been having long hours. Where, where is Lucia? Where have you and your sister-in-law been? Why, well, I, I slept upstairs and saw Lucia was asleep, so we decided to take a little ride down the beach. It was still early. Didn't take anything with you? Certainly not. 
do you mean by that? What would we take? I don't know. I just asked. Did you two try to get Lucia to take some medicine? No. Wait a minute, Beverly. That won't do any good. Yes, we did. She was run down and needed a tonic, but she refused to take medicine. Why did she refuse? I don't know. Maybe she was afraid of being poisoned. That's ridiculous. Why should I want to poison her? I loved Lucia. How long has your sister-in-law Beverly been here with him? Well, I, I don't know. It's quite some time. Just a minute. Are you inferring that Gil and I'm I... not inferring anything. I'm merely asking questions. Well, whoever suggested such a thing is lying. Why, well, Gil and uh, Lucia... Just a moment, Beverly. Mrs. Benson, what have you been saying? What did you tell them? I told them the truth. You think I plan to kill Lucia, is that it? Yes, you and this woman. Why, that's ridiculous. You tried to get her to take some medicine. She knew you were in love with her sister, and you were trying to poison her. When did she come to that conclusion? She had premonitions. That means nothing. And besides, I heard you talking, you and Beverly, planning the whole thing. What? She's out of her mind. I heard you, I tell you. When you realized Lucia wouldn't take the medicine, Beverly said you'd have to think of some other way. Some other way to, to what? To get rid of her. What else? This is the most amazing thing I ever heard of. Dr. Hanby, you know better than this. Do you think I had a reason uh, back of wanting to know about various medicines? No, no, I, I didn't. Not at the time, but but now... Now what? Well, I'm sorry to say it all adds up to something suspicious. It seems more than just coincidental. Do you? Do you think I killed Lucia? Well, look about you. Look at the room. What else am I to think? What was the tonic you tried to give your wife? It had strychnine in it. That right, Durant? Why, oh, yes. It was one of the, the things Dr. Hanby mentioned. It was iron, quinine, and strychnine. Did you mention that, Doctor? Well, I suppose I did. It's a commonly known tonic. Did you add anything else to it, Durant? Certainly not. How about it, Sergeant? What's the report? Why, uh, the bottle contained iron, quinine, and strychnine, and a heavy content of arsenic. Arsenic? But, but it, it isn't possible. I, I put nothing in it. Where would I get arsenic? Well, it was in there just the same. Good Lord, Doctor, it... It isn't true. You know it isn't. I hate to say it, Gil, but the evidence looks bad for you. Benson knows what all this is about. She's lying. She knows Gil wouldn't do such a thing. She's back of it all. Why? I don't know, but believe me, I'll find out if I have... That'll do. Under the circumstances, I think you'd all better come down to headquarters so we can keep you separated. Come on. And no more talking. Forty-eight hours pass, hours of relentless grilling, endless questioning. Finally, Gill and Beverly are released on a writ of habeas corpus. Now weeks have gone by, and Lucia's body has not been discovered, and so the district attorney is forced to make a public announcement that in spite of the apparent evidence, no murder charges can be preferred against Gill and Beverly due to lack of corpus delicti, the failure to produce Lucia's body. Now Beverly and Gill are in the library. Beverly, I... I want you to know how wonderful I think you've been, the way you've stuck right beside me through this thing. I know it's been a trial for you, and... Well, you're one girl in a million. Thanks, Gil, but it isn't over yet. They won't stop their search for Lucia's body, and if they find it, we haven't a chance. I know, but what can we do about it? Well, why couldn't we leave the country? Together? Not necessarily. They'd be sure to follow us. We could go separately in different ways and... And meet someplace later on? Is that what you mean? Yes. That's what I mean. That seems a bit mad. That would equal an out-and-out confession. But, Gil, if they find Lucia's body, we haven't a chance. It's too strong against us. We never could come back, Beverly. Oh, what of it? I, I don't want to die, Gil, and I don't want anything to happen to you. Beverly, I... I don't know what to say. I'm frightened, Gil. I can't stay here with such horrible fear hanging over me. I'll go mad. If you don't go, then I will. I'll leave tonight. Please, Beverly, I need you more than ever now. Please don't go. Don't worry, Gilbert. She won't leave you. Lucia. Good Lord. I won't let her leave you. I'll see that you both go together. And stay together for a long, long time. Lucia, what, what, what does this mean? We thought you were dead. Disappointed, are you? Where have you been? What happened to you? Coming to that. You thought I was dead. Well, I'm not. I'm live enough to pull this trigger. I've been behind those drapes, and I heard every word you said. Now I know you're in love with each other. Now I know you wanted to do away with me. In love? With Beverly? From the day she came here. She took you away from me. I did not. We never thought of such a thing, never. It never entered my mind. Why do you lie about it? You do love her. Why don't you admit it? I love Beverly? Yes. 
You certainly have a vicious mind, Lucia. For the first time, I see you for what you really are. I never even thought of such a thing. But now that you mention it, I... I realize the truth. Yes, I do love Beverly. Gil, don't. Why shouldn't I? And it's Lucia's fault. She's the cause of it. A suspicious-minded devil. She let her imagination run away with her. She built this thing up, and now it's boomeranged on her. Oh, what a mess you've made of things, Lucia. You mean... You and Beverly... You didn't plan... Certainly not. You must have been out of your mind. Oh, Gil. Gil. I thought... I, I was sure. Oh, Gil. Gil. I'm sorry, Lisa, but that's the way it is. And you've no one to blame but your own miserable self. <laughs> No one to blame but her own miserable, jealous, suspicious-minded self. <laughs> Lucia planned the whole thing from the beginning. She thought they were in love, thought they were planning to kill her. Lucia never had a dream, never had a premonition. She planted that in the housekeeper's mind and in the doctor's. She put the rat poison in the tonic. She put the bedroom in disorder, cut herself of smeared blood on the bed, and then disappeared. But when she read that they couldn't bring a murder charge without the body, she came back to kill Gil and Beverly herself. You see, Lucia didn't know about that little article in the law called Corpus Delicti. CBS has presented The Whistler. Original music for this production was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. The Whistler is written by and directed by J. Donald Wilson and originates from Columbia Square in Hollywood. Next Sunday, 9.15... I, The Whistler, will return to tell you the eerie tale of... Back from Beyond. <laughs> This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio